All right, everyone. Well, good morning. It gives me a great pleasure to uh, start this second day of the EU Academy launch event and workshop. So we had a really interesting uh, first day yesterday, and it's great to see a few of you back today for the second day, and also to see other colleagues uh, able to join us um, today as well. So we have a very packed uh, program, which I will outline in a minute. But first of all, I would like to put on record our thanks to the European Union for co-funding the EU Academy, including this um, event. So good morning, everyone. My name is Sarah Lennard. I'm a Jean Monnet chair, and uh, I work together with um, Christian on uh, the EU Academy project. Uh, Christian being the uh, director of the um, EU Academy. And uh, today we have a very good mix of sessions, some of them looking at teaching the European Union and others looking at more, uh, let's say, content related uh, issues, because it's important to, to talk about both, of course. So we heard yesterday from people teaching on the European Union, both at university and, and, uh, and in schools, that in Ireland, uh, the EU is not the subject that teachers or students find necessarily the most enthusing. And there's a certain tendency also, it seems, to understand the EU as being mainly about trade and about um, the economy. And so I guess uh, some of the sessions we'll have later today on some of the challenges facing the European Union or on Ireland and the European Union, including our keynote lecture at 11.30 today uh, by Professor John O'Brennan, will be about actually um, trying to convince ourselves, I suppose, that the EU is indeed exciting and uh, more than just about economic issues or, or trade. But without further ado, I would like to introduce our first uh, session. So session A4 is entitled Teaching the European Union Perspectives from Various Disciplines. And I'm delighted that uh, four colleagues from uh, uh, across Ireland have been able to join us to discuss uh, the European Union and teaching the European Union from various disciplinary backgrounds. So we will start first with Professor Joachim Fischer from the University of Limerick, who will be talking on cultural and literary dimensions of EU study. So um, it seems that uh, Joachim is, is an old friend of a few of, of you there, uh, <laughs> but I shall still introduce him. <laughs> <laughs> so he studied in Mainz, Glasgow, Bonn, and Trinity College, Dublin, and he holds a Jean Monnet chair in European Cultural Studies and is director of the Center for European Studies at the University of Limerick. He is also senior lecturer in German and deputy director of the Center for Irish German Studies. His research interests include the history of Irish German relations, cultural dimensions of European integration, the Irish image of Germany, as well as national images and stereotypes. The second presentation will be given by uh, Dr. Christy uh, Petit from Dublin City University, um, who will be talking about teaching EU law after <clears throat> um, crisis. And I guess the EU often seems to be in a state of crisis. And I guess there's another one unfolding as we speak. So they will be apparently at 12 noon in Brussels, uh, an important vote in the European Parliament about uh, somebody who, who may be about uh, well, somebody who, who has had, uh, as you know, some, uh, you know, some trouble over the last few days with uh, the Belgian uh, police, it seems. So uh, Dr. Petit is assistant professor in the School of Law and Government at DTU and is affiliated with the Brexit Institute. Her research interests cover EU legal studies, financial supervision and regulation, as well as central banking and comparative perspectives. And she defended her PhD thesis at the European University Institute and graduated from the Ecole Normale Supérieure in Law, Economics and Management in France and in European Law from the College of Europe. And then the third uh, presentation will be given by uh, Dr. Niall Moran, uh, also at Dublin City University. So Niall is an assistant professor in economic law in the School of Law and Government. 
he holds a PhD in international economic law from Bocconi University and has worked for the legal service of the Council of the European Union and the bilateral relations with the Americas units at DJ Agri, European Commission. Previously, he was lecturer in law at Middlesex University London, as well as a visiting researcher at the Université Libre de Bruxelles. His research interests include EU law, international trade law, WTO law, as well as uh, trade and investment in agriculture. And finally, our fourth presentation will be given by Dr. Uh, Connor Gavin from uh, University College Dublin. So Dr. Gavin is based in the School of Education at UCD and he's director of the Doctorate in Education program uh, at the School of Education, where he lectures on various education, sustainability, public policy and research methods programs. He's UCD lead on TAPTS, an Erasmus Plus Teacher Academies project involving higher education institutions in five European countries working on teaching sustainability. And in addition, he's the lead investigator on JNTP UCD, an inaugural Germany teacher action project building content and pedagogical models relating to the teaching of European values and understanding within the secondary school system in Ireland. So as we have four speakers in an hour and a half, I would suggest that each speaker has 12 to 15 minutes and you are all co-hosts. So if you want to, if you have some slides and you want to share your screen, then you will be able to do so. Mm -hmm. So Joachim, you have the floor. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah. Uh, let me just see. I'll uh, just... Uh... Share my screen with you. <clears throat> Can you see this? Yeah, okay. Sorry, I'm just trying to, doesn't seem to do what I wanted to do. Um, Sorry, yes. slideshow. Slideshow. slideshow yeah uh yeah i can't i can't get at it uh sorry sorry okay slideshow okay um and uh slideshow from the beginning can you see what i'm doing no we can see the the, the general uh, slide deck, but it's not gone to presentation mode. Oh, sorry, it's all right. I, it 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 happens to all of us. Oh, um, uh, I had it. I had it in a minute. I, I had it just uh, before. Let me just see now. What am I doing? Um, it might help to close the one that you had open and yeah. and, and restart yeah. that sometimes that okay. works it's a bit like okay. microsoft you know restart and see what happens okay <clears throat> okay okay um so just see now um i'll try and share screen again and uh, i'll do this one can you see this yes we can yes okay slideshow from the beginning okay you can see my slides now yeah it just seems that it's it's still trying to load the presentation it seems okay Everything looks fine for me. That's all right. Don't worry, <laughs> we can see the slides. We, we you can, you we can see, see the, the slides on the, oh, on the side, so it's not. Uh, yeah, okay. Well, my, my, my apologies for the little uh, technical glitch here. As long as you can see, see my slides, yeah. um, um, it's, it's all right. Um, Yes, I have, as Sarah said, uh, I'm, I have a, a chair in European Cultural Studies, and uh, there's a, a perhaps more uh, a, a more 
uh, unconventional Jean Monnet chair, and it's the first uh, chair in Ireland uh, with a, a clear cultural and literary remit. Uh, so what I'll uh, be talking about is uh, basically the kind of work that I do, what, uh, what the chair does, um, and um, uh, some of it involves uh, uh, primary, secondary schools, uh, and I'll also be talking about my uh, uh, my work in uh, UL as well. Uh, all of it, as you, as you will see, has a um, uh, a cultural uh, cultural dimension, a cultural focus. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, as far as primary uh, schools is concerned, uh, the um, uh, my my work involved um, a an interaction with a primary school. This is a, a picture of a a, a local a primary school where I went with um, uh, with students, uh, mainly Erasmus students, who uh, were uh, uh, talking, who were participating in a module, uh, and were. Uh, telling the, uh, the the children about their own background, uh, what uh, um, UL, what what uh, uh, the European Union means to them in their own country, uh, and uh, that was a, um, a a classical way of uh, bringing the European Union to uh, to life and going beyond the the things that we normally associate with the European Union, which is uh, legal aspects, economic aspects, and political aspects, uh, and this was really my starting point to uh, bring a, a kind of a cultural uh, um, dimension into the discussion, not only about uh, Europe generally, but about the European Union as well, and uh, uh, and this was a uh, an attempt of. Uh, um, doing this at a uh, primary school. You will see that uh, what I'm talking about here is uh, uh, there is very little theory. A lot of it is uh, 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 practice uh, and uh, the um, um, all, all of my, my teaching was uh, very much uh, interactive and uh, try to engage the students as, as much as uh, is possible. My own background, as, as Sarah said, is in uh, uh, German studies, so uh, I'll bring the uh, uh, cultural language dimension to uh, Europe uh, automatically in that way. Um, uh, as far as secondary schools is concerned, this is not not uh, exactly what I did, but it is uh, an as a, a a point that I would like to make and perhaps uh, uh, offer that uh, for discussion later on. Uh, it's important for me uh, to uh, state that I I would like to see European studies, European Union studies, to go beyond the obvious subjects, CSPE and uh, politics and society, economics, business. Um, and um, uh, and find a place in uh, subjects um, uh, like modern languages, where it is uh, 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 where I think it it should find it uh, its natural place, uh, considering that uh, we have uh, uh, that the European Union um, is multilingual and only one point five percent of the EU's population speak English as a mother tongue. Uh, one would expect the European Union to feature in uh, uh, the languages classroom, and um, uh, and this, in fact, uh, has uh, my my impression is from looking at the um, uh, at uh, the the curricula over the, uh, the the last decades, it appears to have decreased rather than increased. Uh, there was a stronger focus in the nineteen. Uh, um, uh, 1990s, uh, 2000s on uh, the European Union in the languages classroom uh, than there is now. So that this, uh, I, in my view, uh, should be revived. And, and the other two subjects that I find uh, very important are English and they would, uh, English and Irish, and they would hardly ever be considered in uh, our context here in European Union studies. But because of uh, the point that I made that English, uh, is a small language within the European Union. It's also the biggest one uh, in the sense that it is lingua franca. And uh, so it is perfectly possible, perhaps even necessary to reconceptualize English as, as this uh, uh, very subject, as the subject of the, uh, the EU's uh, lingua franca. And we, uh, we then could bring elements into the classroom that are uh, of a uh, that have a European dimension, a comparative element, but also uh, a text that uh, uh, 
focus on, on Europe or travel writing is another uh, obvious one. Uh, and uh, I uh, collected in another context, and I'll talk about that in a minute, I collected a few uh, texts by Irish writers on Europe, which could also feature in uh, uh, in the, the the subject of English, uh, uh, and uh, it seems to me that um, th this uh, at present is happening only to a very very limited uh, degree. The social media uh, media studies is part of the English curriculum, and uh, uh, one could also uh, probably uh, integrate uh, European social media in uh, into the classroom that way. Irish uh, it has uh, become an important subject since Irish uh, has be, uh, become a fully fledged uh, European uh, and official European uh, uh, language. The uh, derogation is finished. Uh, it uh, finished on the 1st of January. So uh, this um, uh, would also seem to be a classroom uh, that, that uh, uh, we could reconfigure or re reimagine perhaps as a European subject, it might even help uh, the, uh, the the image of the Irish language uh, it's, itself, uh, perhaps bring it into a more modern uh, context. Uh, art and religious education, I'll just uh, mention in passing, uh, which uh, can also have a European uh, dimension. Um, moving to third level, um, I um, I uh, can talk a little bit uh, what I did. I mentioned this Jean Monnet module with the primary and secondary schools already, um, but uh, I've also uh, um, uh, designed a European studies workshop with a, a, a lot of, um, uh, with in, which integrates uh, um, experiences from the, the real world by bringing politicians and uh, uh, and uh, business leaders into into the classroom, but the other the other important aspect uh, the, the, uh, that I uh, uh, that I brought to this workshop was a literary uh, dimension. And there is a wonderful, uh, as it happens, there is a wonderful uh, novel set in Brussels uh, where, where all the characters are uh, uh, European officials. Uh, it was originally written in German, uh, but uh, um, it now. Uh, there, there is an English tradition, The Capital by Robert Menasse, an Austrian uh, 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 writer, and it's a wonderful resource to teach uh, European studies, European Union studies differently. Uh, and uh, I might also mention in passing that I uh, uh, use this book uh, in an outreach activity uh, with um, uh, in Limerick City Library, and it was also very successful. Another uh, uh, cultural uh, um, activity uh, or uh, cultural aspect uh, that I um, uh, the, uh, a, a, a European di a di a dimension in another uh, culturally focused class is my European cinema class, and uh, I used a, a German Bulgarian um, um, film there by Maren Griesebach, uh, Western. Some of you uh, may have seen it. Uh, and uh, lastly, I uh, am also involved in uh, Utopian studies and uh, in a Utopian MA seminar, I um, discussed uh, Europe as Utopia uh, by means of a, uh, a text written by a, um, a German political scientist um, um, on, uh, on this uh, very topic. Um, <clears throat> the... Uh, 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 part of my chair was also to set up a double degree program uh, and with a German university, uh, the Europa Universität Flensburg, a very uh, European focused university. And the point, uh, the point of uh, uh, this program is uh, uh, that it integrates, once again, a cultural dimension uh, into the uh, into European studies, which is rarely done at postgraduate level. Uh, it's one of the very few uh, programs that uh, offers the uh, an opportunity for languages students to continue their language studies in French, uh, German, and Spanish. And uh, these are the, uh, the, uh, the modules here. I also, if you don't have the language, you can do uh, the, um, the program in English. But the point is that there is a, a, a very um, a clear a European uh, a, a cultural option in the uh, um, in the program, which is popular, uh, but uh, you don't have to take it. You can do a law uh, politics as well. Um, 
the I, I mentioned the um, the uh, Irish writers on uh, Europe. Um, I put together with uh, colleagues in the European Federation of uh, Centers and Associations of Irish Studies (EFSIS) a website called Kaleidoscope, uh, and uh, it collected uh, uh, it. Um, asked Irish writers to reflect on Europe, which they did in essay form and in uh, literary form, uh, but I also uh, asked them to uh, uh, reflect more specifically on the European Union and uh, the their answers uh, have been published on the website, uh, both the um, survey and the, the text are wonderful teaching materials for uh, the English class classroom, but also in, in a third level uh, material, which um, would normally perhaps uh, uh, not be considered in, uh, in uh, European studies uh, uh, classes. Um, the, uh, I mentioned Irish. Uh, I have a bit of Irish myself, and with two uh, specialists in Irish, I, uh, I'm putting together an anthology of travel writing in Irish. Uh, on Europe, uh, which is in its final stages and will be published uh, next year. Uh, I uh, find these texts particularly uh, important because uh, uh, it's in text in Irish that uh, people, uh, that uh, writers reflect perhaps mo most intensely on what it means to, to, uh, to uh, be Irish. And uh, also of interest to me, they are very interested in the language aspect, which you don't find perhaps to the same degree in texts in English. And um, I uh, just mean, mentioned that in passing, that was also a, a product of my Jean Monnet chair. And uh, as you know, Michael D. Higgins, our president, is a poet as well. So there is a, a, a good, uh, um, there are, is, are many essays in this, uh, this book with a cultural focus. Uh, and uh, largely, and this is my uh, last slide, and uh, I'll, I'll flag this to you, it might be a bit small, but it's a, a, an upcoming essay competition um, where um, I take the opposite perspective to what is usually done, not backwards. Uh, what do 50 years of Europe mean to us? I'm looking forward. What might Europe look like in 50 years time? Uh, Europa, Europa uh, 2073 is the topic. And I'm asking third level students uh, in Ireland uh, to uh, reflect on this very topic. How do you imagine Ireland in 50 years? Uh, there are prizes to be won and uh, the texts uh, uh, to be submitted uh, can be in English, uh, Irish, French, German, and Spanish. Uh, these are the uh, languages and uh, a particular feature uh, uh, and uh, which I haven't explored significantly, uh, sufficiently perhaps in the past is uh, the art element. Uh, uh, I'm also approaching art colleges to submit work to imagine Ireland in 50 years time. I don't know what I'm going to get. It's, uh, uh, I think it's uh, worth doing. And uh, the results um, will come in in February. Deadline is in February. You will all get an announcement, and I hope you'll distribute it among your students. Um, and uh, the first prizes in each category will be 500 euros, so uh, it's it's worth it. And uh, the um, uh, the best work will be published on our website, uh, and uh, the prizes will be awarded at the end of uh, March. That's my presentation. Thank you very very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Joachim. Yeah, that sounds very exciting. I'm sure we, we're certainly looking forward to seeing what people are imagining. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds really very interesting. So thank you for that. And uh, we're now moving on to our second presentation. So Christy, you have the floor. Hi. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Sarah. Also, thanks to Christian uh, for the invitation. And I'm very pleased to participate in this second day of the launching conference of the EU Academy. So I'm Christy Petit. As uh, Sarah already said, I'm assistant professor in EU law and banking and finance law at the School of Law and Government. And I suggested to, to focus on teaching EU law after crisis. And maybe I should have added in, and in context. I will uh, tell you what I mean by that. Uh, here we are at the crossroad of different disciplines, so law, economics, political economy to some extent, and business or organizational study. And I will share some elements. So, of course, I'm not um, 
I will I will share, of course, some examples and substantive elements, but, but my point is more to share with you some uh, tools, some reflections as to the experience developed over uh, the recent years. Um, in the title, you have a prologue, so crisis. Um, it's uh, unfortunately the case. There is a number of them. Considering the field of banking and finance, I will uh, name only a few. I cannot um, give credit to all the ones we're facing at the moment. Um, but maybe to reflect upon this vocabulary, this word before, it raises challenges, risks, but also some way for, ways forward with uh, some solutions that we need to think about, that we can reflect upon with students also in the classroom, um, and potentially some further opportunities to kind of rebound. And, and this is also part of the uh, historical uh, constructions of the EU. So uh, here um, in the field of banking and finance law and policy, we can of course mention the great financial crisis. And this is uh, an expression that is not from me, but from established academics. And this is to encompass the fact that there are many different crises that happened and unfolded in 2007, 2008, first with the financial and banking crisis, but then unfolded in the uh, euro area as a debt crisis. And this concerns uh, several member states, uh, among them Ireland, with some financial assistance programs, some very difficult measures, and and kind of you know um, also at the level of the of the engagement and and what citizens could see is like was made massive bailouts from from governments and and the fact that there were some uh, critical comings and, and mistakes made in some private organizations. So anyway, so I will get back to the points of, of how um, regulation and, and, and the supervisory architecture adapted to this uh, situation. But of course, over crisis, so the pandemics, I don't need to explain uh, anything about that, the climate crisis and also geopolitical and economic consequences. So what we have observed in uh, the last time in the last year, unfortunately, with the invasion of uh, Ukraine by Russia and here, the, the, I'm referring to the economic uh, sanctions with the adoption, but also the, the, the issues related to enforcement. So uh, here is just to, to kind of explain the, the word crisis in broad form in this field. And in, in terms of EU studies, EU legal studies, even if, as I said, it, it's from a multidisciplinary perspective here, uh, I want to be very open about um, my background. So Sarah um, pinpointed at it, but I think we are very uh, much influenced by how we were ourselves educated and, and our degrees. And here, certainly the, what I'm teaching within this module, EU law, um, EU banking and finance law after NGU, um, the fact that I studied law, but also economics and business in France, and then went to an international environment in Bruges and then uh, at the EUI, I'm very much influenced by the different settings. So very much ex cathedra very vertical in, in my home country, but then in other settings on the reading basis spaces with much more engagement, much more uh, so what we call inverted classes, and, and the fact that you have this active thinking, so giving some knowledge, giving some tools, and then really giving a, a forum and giving the opportunity for to the students to, to raise their voices. And, and here, I think even in a technical field like the one I'm, I'm presenting on uh, now, um, it's very important, and this is where uh, active learning and engaged um, students can be kind of flourishing and 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 um, um, be happy with the student the the module too, right? So okay, um, I hear the alarm. Um, I don't know what should we do, uh, Sarah. I'm afraid we have a fire alarm again. So hopefully. A few of us here in the have to leave, but uh, hopefully we will be back very soon. So please stay with us, and hopefully we will be back soon. Apologies for that. I suppose it could just be a test. I mean, I, I might just I, I might just go ahead now unless anyone else wants to go exactly. first. Absolutely fine. That sounds, yeah. Yeah. It's John, is, John anyway. is that okay? Yes, John, exactly. is that okay with that's, you? That's a good idea. Yeah. 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 Let's do that. Niall, off you. Oh, you can use your screen. That's very impressive. Okay. Okay.
Um, okay, so I'm going to be talking about um, teaching EU trade policy in Ireland. And uh, Joaquin, thanks for reminding me of the novel Die Hauptstadt. Um, yes. I read it, really enjoyed it. And one of the main themes is the negotiation of a trade deal with China. Precisely. But, yeah. <laughs> so I might try and find a way of bringing that into my class, you know, something, you know, a bit more, uh, <laughs> a bit of fiction to, to help move things on. Um, so I'm going to talk about three main areas. So what is EU trade policy? Why it interests me? What is different or challenging about teaching this in Ireland? And how do I address these challenges uh, when I'm teaching EU policy in Ireland? So um, when I'm introducing this area to students, I begin with an overview of international trade, what that is, and um, the role of the EU in this area. So on international trade, I emphasize a few points. Uh, firstly, the idea that free trade is the exception, both historically and in terms of international relations, and the EU single market is certainly a representation of that. Uh, and secondly, uh, the idea that this is a really emerging area, that the rule book for trade is developing every year, and new scholarship in this area can really make a difference. So in terms of the role for the EU in this area, I discussed the roles of the EU institutions, so a few points are fundamental, such as the exclusive competence of the union for the common commercial policy, including the negotiation of free trade agreements. Then I talk about the role of the various institutions, the council, the parliament and the commission. Uh, so I also really emphasize the democratic safeguards surrounding the conclusion of EU trade agreements so that this is not something imposed on Ireland by Brussels. And rather the council and the parliament um, that this is us at the table, that we sign off on these agreements and that each member state has a veto. So on why this area interests me, I started working in the area of international trade law in 2015 when I moved to Brussels. I worked on EU trade agreements uh, in my unit, work, dealing with the Americas. So I worked on agreements with the Mercosur countries, Brazil, etc., uh, the United States, etc., and I also worked on the preparation of these trade negotiations and legal disputes that were ongoing both at the WTO and under EU trade agreements. So I try to emphasize to my students that there's arguably never been a more interesting time to be studying international trade, that the law and policy in this area is undergoing rapid change in response to things like Brexit, the challenges at the WTO, etc. And I try to emphasize the importance of these areas and how many of the great articles that we're reading, they've been written in the last couple of years and how they can make a contribution and build on these articles. Uh, so one of the things I try to do with my class is to adapt the content in terms of what's really topical in a given year. So last year, for instance, we focused more on COVID related topics, restrictions on exports, vaccines in transit, intellectual property waivers, et cetera. And this year, uh, there'll likely be more of a focus um, on economic sanctions in the context of the invasion of Ukraine, um, et cetera. So I, I try to adapt the content, but there is a focus on four core areas, and these include the trade rulebook of the EU at the WTO and under its trade agreements, such as CETA, which they've probably heard of, trade disputes, cases involving the EU at the WTO, and you can see all of the EU's pleadings um, on GG Trade's website, so it's really accessible. EU trade negotiations, both bilaterally with partners uh, and at the WTO multilaterally, and then EU trade defence instruments and recent initiatives such as CBAM, so where the EU is trying to um, equalise basically the cost of carbon at its border uh, with the price of it inside the EU. Uh, we'll skip the slide. So in terms of the what's different or challenging about teaching this topic in Ireland, uh, I think one challenge is that the path to a career in trade is not so obvious. So I've taught trade in the UK, France, I've studied it in Italy and Belgium. And often in these places, there are law firms recruiting trade lawyers. Um, and this, is, this pathway is not so clear in, in Ireland. And I think that's true for international law and for EU law in general. Um, there are opportunities in Brussels, Geneva, etc., they are very competitive. Uh, you can work for law firms, you can work for the EU, the Irish government, trade associations in this area. Generally speaking, it is very competitive, as we were just talking about, to get into the EU and to get these positions. But I always emphasize that 
if you are really interested and I've, I've, I know so many people that that have, you know, pursued it and that, that have been able to might make a career for themselves in these areas. So I also another challenge is, um, you know, related to the challenge is the idea that this is an area with huge society wide and political implications um, and also few people have expertise in this area. So this can bring opportunities. And this is particularly important um, in Ireland, particularly post Brexit, given the importance of trading relations in recent times to us. So I try to tie in the topics that we're covering with areas directly related to Irish interest, Brexit, the Irish position on Mercosur, et cetera. Um, on making the EU law and policy more relevant to students, I underline the value of the single market, the benefits of doing things such as negotiating trade agreements as a block of 27, um, the benefits that come with this. Um, and then in terms of making it feel a bit closer to home, we do have you know the study trips. And we are lucky, of course, that there's the Brexit Institute in DCU. So there's usually events happening, publications coming out where I can direct the students um, to further their, their interest in this area. Uh, so just some general thoughts on how I address these challenges and teach EU trade policy. The majority of the students taking my module do so because you know, they're interested or they have some ancillary interest. So they might be starting a master's in public international law the following year, international relations. They might have a general interest in the EU or some theme like agriculture or the environment. So I try to chat with the students and get to know the reasons why they're studying it, how they've come to this topic as soon as I can. Um, and I, I try to link the material that we cover in class with their interests. So if I know that there's a, a particular interest, if we've had an interesting discussion the previous day, I might assign them an article from you know, a leading publication, the Financial Times, Wall Street Journal, etc., uh, on one of these topics that they're interested in and begin a discussion at the start of class with some questions that I prepare in advance based on the article um, that they've read. So I see this as the challenge of coaxing the students into participating in, in the class, as, as Christy was talking about. And I, I really, I want to get to the point where the students are asking me questions, because this is the best way that they can learn as quickly as possible and, and, and basically just draw on the expertise. And that's the, really the value that the lecturer brings to class. Um, so I, I also try and get them to learn and question each other about their, their research topic or whatever it might be. Um, and I also try to leave the classes a little bit open. So each group is different, see what the students react best to, and just maybe go with that a little bit. Um, so I have your don't fear the silence. So I, I, I try to avoid, you know, having the 50 minute monologue uh, in an hour long lecture. And I, I do ask the students to take a moment to reflect on something, tell them to take a note of something. Um, and just give a little bit of a pause for people to get ready to ask a question. Um, and I, I regularly seek input from the students, even you know, if it's just a nodding of the head to see that they're, they're still with me. So in the trade classes, I've usually had you know, about eight to 35 students per class over the past number of years. And the atmosphere can be very different to lectures with over 100 students. Um, and, and I think that great learning can happen in these you know smaller environments where we can really drill down into the the, the issues on a particular topic and it, it can almost begin to resemble you know practice as a lawyer when you are um you know focusing on a mood problem question or something like that and you know there's rapid exchange of ideas in, in these small groups so there is some scope for this i have found in in the trade classes where the students, you know, they're, they're completing these side readings, they're, they're writing essays in particular areas, and it, there can be a really informed um, discussion in class. Um, so I also, as, as I've said, try to make the material interactive. So I try to have one interactive activity per lecture. I might just have an icebreaker question halfway through the slides or something like that. So just one that I wrote down the other day on, on one of my slides, would you be more likely to purchase Irish lamb over New Zealand lamb because of its lower carbon footprint? get them to discuss that for a minute and then show them a study showing that even for consumption in Ireland, New Zealand lamb has a lower carbon footprint due to using less artificial feed and fertilizers. And then I get their reaction to that. So, so just as a way of you know, getting them discussing in small groups and then feeding back to the class. And um, finally, um, I heard about this idea of differentiation and I use this as a guiding principle in my teaching. 
Um, so a teacher friend uh, told me about this and it kind of resonated with me. So I regularly return to this idea. And it's the idea that in each class I teach, I aim it for, for it to be adapted to the student who is maybe struggling to, to pass the module um, or the year, as well as the student who might be looking to do a PhD in this area in the next year or two. So for, for the first student, I make sure that there is a focus on the basics, that the topic is situated within the larger context of the module. Um, on each slide, I try to introduce it with um, the, the more simpler concepts um, and have the more complicated ideas at the towards the bottom of the slide. I also give a clear picture of how this fits into the exam that they're preparing for and what is necessary for it. Also, if we're reading an article or something, that this is an activity where you know they don't have to be concentrating as as you know intensely, um, and and basically that the, you know they can relax a little bit for certain periods of the class. Um, so then, for the second student that is really interested in the area, um, I try to have a research component. So students in my undergraduate class and postgraduate they submit essays. So each student kind of has their own research area. And this builds on the, the interest that I've you know, become aware of in, of each of the students. And I always make it clear in whatever topic we're doing where they can go to, to deepen their reading on this topic and further, further reading, basically. Uh, at the end of class, I, I try to always make myself available if they have any follow up questions. So a bit of a chat after class. And I, I'm always emphasizing the importance of the essay component and the research elements in, in an area like trade law. Um, OK, I, I think I'll finish up there. Love to have been in your class. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. Very good. And Niall, can I ask you, the, uh, your students, they are undergraduate students or what, what year are they in? Uh, yeah. Last year, I joined DCU last year. So last year, I just had undergrads. And this year, I'm starting the um, the, the, the MELP um, postgraduate module. So yeah. mm -hmm. but I, I was teaching Middlesex previously. So I was kind of drawing on uh, my both, you know, the postgraduate and undergraduate mm -hmm. that I did there. Mm -hmm. And are you involved in uh, training teachers as well? In <coughs> uh, no. No. Mm -hmm. Just a, a very brief reaction, Niall. I really loved what you're saying there about the the kind of the introduction of differentiation. And you'll be happy to know you're doing more than one type of differentiation there. And go and talk to your teacher friend again. I mean, there's <laughs> there's there's, there's differentiation in terms of um, by student. You're also differentiating in terms of your materials. You know, uh, different materials to suit different challenges and different topics. And then by the activities. So you know, it's it's a lovely mix. Congratulations. It's it's a it's a it's a really um, it's a really kind of interactive thing that you've got going there. So well done, sir. Thanks a lot, Father. Yeah, I, I I went away with Suez uh, when I was doing the, the kind of teaching programs. Yeah, in yeah. And we had um you know one of the the people there was a teacher and she was just telling us about various concepts and stuck with me you know so I I, I tried to keep it in mind. Mm -hmm. Very good. But could I ask, do you find there's much interest in the TIPP type of stuff? In other words, the sort of international politics of it and the investment court and all that stuff. Um, I, I'll be I'll be interested to see what it's like with the postgrads this year. Uh, with the undergrads, I found last year that the topic that got the most traction was the um, waivers on, on on the COVID vaccines. Um, and investment, it's not strictly within the remit of the class. But um, I, I'll, I'll, I'll probably bring it in at some point. And yeah, I'll be, I'll be interested to see this year now, because obviously Seed has been in the news a lot and mm -hmm. um, what the reaction is. Uh, when I was in the UK, a lot of the students tended to be you know, from Europe anyway. But um, you know, we, we did have some some good discussions about, you know, attitudes to the EU and, you know, it was perhaps, you know, less um, enthusiastic compared to what it is in Dublin, I'd say. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not sure if Christian and Sarah have managed to rejoin us. 
both showing, but they're not showing as active. So mm. because they're co-hosts, they're probably just both sitting there, mm -hmm. John, to be honest. I think it's mm. kind of your call. Yeah. 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 So I'm not sure wh who would like to go next. Well, I think I'm the last man standing. Yeah, am I? Last yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'm going to try and share screen. Um, okay, and Connor. I'll, thanks I'll so much. Let you know how it goes. <laughs> um, this will probably be every bit as much as a disaster as uh, as previously, <laughs> but we'll give it a go. Okay. Uh, share screen. So you should see my screen at the moment, and you now should see my slides just somebody you kind of let me know what's what's showing up if i'm going the right direction yeah, yeah perfect. okay and it should now be in it should now be in display mode am i right yeah, yeah perfect. okay perfect then we're good to go yeah. all right uh, again I'll, I'll i'll go through <clears throat> a little bit quickly i have more slides than i really need so um but that's my my need of a, for a comfort blanket so i'm going to kind of skip through things and they will be available afterwards for people to have a look mm. with i'll start by saying that uh, tap ts tap-ts.eu is our main website for this particular project and i'm delighted to say that it's up in in framework form so you know don't go there expecting massive amounts of material or anything just yet but it has started to to take form so if you wanted to kind of follow us and keep an eye on what we're doing in the project that's the place to go it'll be one central hub for all of our activities in relation to the entire uh, project itself so tap-ts.eu the presentation today, I owe uh, thanks to my colleague, Elena Revikina, who's in uh, the University of Vienna, who helped me prepare the materials. Um, and it's just, it's a whistle stop tour, um, to be perfectly honest. So a, a, a little bit different from what Niall was saying, I'm not talking about a specific course, I'm talking more about a project. And um, we are one of 11 projects, three of which, as I say, are on the island of Ireland. Uh, we were funded in 21, it's a three-year project. And our function as a project is to work on strengthening European pre-service and in-service preparation. So we're, we're working on materials and we're working on um, activities. It, the focus is nominally about teaching sustainability, but it goes much deeper than that. You're welcome. You'll be pleased to hear that there's cultural dimensions and there's eco-social dimensions and so on that, that work through it as well. Mm -hmm. So our specific surface focus is on environmental sustainability. We're also looking at social inclusion, digitalization, variations on entrepreneurship and the pedagogical approaches, the teaching and learning approaches that kind of support that sort of stuff. Now, the basic line that we've taken is that there's a shortage of materials and there's a shortage of expertise among secondary teachers and primary teachers. So we've decided to produce what we call LTPs or learning and teaching packages. These are bu uh, bunches of material that we've carefully curated from across various areas of our own interest. They're engaging, they're flexible, they can be used in online form, they can be used in face-to-face -face form. And our other challenge is to build a network of teachers particularly who are actually using these materials so that we can learn one from the other. So that's kind of us in a, in a sort of a nutshell. Um, our, our consortium has three pillars and I think the third one is probably the most interesting in many senses. It's very, very seldom you have a, a European level project that has ordinary, in inverted commas, schools as partners. So we have two school partners. And the voice of those teachers from those schools is profoundly important in shaping the direction we're going in terms of what teachers need uh, and what teachers can use. So kind of working through that, we're very privileged also to have the Cyprus Pedagogical Institute on board as our main, um, if you like, I, I don't like using the word provider, but our main organizer of the summer schools that we're running in association with the academy. So they will be in Cyprus and uh, the, the first of them will be in a, a sustainability farm. So we're bringing a bunch of 50 teachers to a sustainability farm in Cyprus. That could be fun. We, <laughs> uh, reports at the end of the summer, we'll let you know how it goes. Our academic partners then, the project has been led by TU Dresden, University College Dublin is the second and uh, the major partner, Pedagogical University of Vienne is the third, and then the Polytechnic Institute of Santarém in Portugal is the fourth. Between us, we cover the full range of primary, secondary and further education. We also have an education technology company, which is building our site for us and which is providing us with the backbone so that we're not tied to any individual institution. It's a European level activity. And Umina will provide us with the backbone for the 
the, the, the delivery of our online programs and the blended aspects. We have heavily involvement by a sustainability civil society, uh, Core Edu in Leipzig, and we have a quality insurance company that interestingly specializes mostly in engineering but they're coming on board as a quality assurance company to help us in relation to the work that we're doing on the project. I'm not going to dwell on this. We, you know, we have, we have a very kind of interesting architecture uh, that involves a moot where we all meet regularly and talk to each other. We have all of the necessary, you know, um, uh, structures. The one I'd point you to is the red one on the right, the pedagogical advisory group. We have an independent group of critical friends, and we have been very, very lucky in terms of the group that we've attracted there. They are major players in relation to um, sustainability from right across Europe and indeed beyond. And they are sitting in the background advising us, making comments on what we're doing and helping us to structure the direction of travel that we're actually uh, taking the project. We have all the usual stuff. I won't again go into this. We have all the usual sort of work packages, communications, quality. Uh, we've one package that connects to the workshops and the activities. And we've one that's to do with the production of the materials. And then we have the management, the usual sort of stuff. Again, very quickly, that the point here is that these two, these two packages connect intimately one with the other. The first package that you see there is about developing the resources, the materials and the methodologies. And again, you can see that we have deliverable points. Uh, we're, about, we're, we're, we're up to about D2.1 V1 just there, the second of the dotted blue lines. So we're now producing the draft materials that will be tested in the spring, finalized as we go forward, and then presented um, in final version in a compendium towards the back end of the, the project. There are a number of lines because they're all involving at least two partners producing banks of material. Um, that are different, but that interconnect. And then in the, pack, the work package below it, this is how we will disseminate, this is how we will spread, this is how we will use and publicize our materials. Online learning activities, active learning events, which are hybrid, part in the real world, part online, and then the academies, which are the summer schools or spring schools effectively. And they'll be the sort of the flagship events where we'll actually um, you know, put, put everything together and um, They'll be run by the various partners and they'll also have uh, contributions from teachers and others who are interested in sustainability. So it's all about co-design, co-teaching and finalizing, I, I suppose, in, in a summary version, piloting uh, materials, sharpening them up and then moving on to the next thing. These are our focus strands. Now, again, they all connect, as I say, something to do with sustainability, um, but they're also they, they go much, much deeper. They have these eco-social concerns bedded through them. They have understandings of the European Green Deal, and they have understandings of what it is to, to, to approach these from a particularly European perspective. So you can see, for example, D26, green citizenship in and for Europe. And again, led by the schools, interestingly, in, 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 in that one. Then the whole D25 um, disinformation, the whole problem about, you know, disinformation and how to deal with it and all of that, climate resilience, uh, climate entrepreneurship. We feel that's important. Now we use entrepreneurship in the broadest sense, creativity, imagination, innovation, finding ways of making things happen in your school and in your community that you know might not otherwise happen. So that's the, the focus, if you like, of our main banks of material. And we're very pleased with how they're all developing so far. They're all at um, pretty much advanced uh, development stage and now ready for piloting in the spring. Roadmap, again, this will be available if you want to have a look at it. Um, Niall, you might find a couple of things in here that are useful to you in terms of thinking in, about uh, pedagogy and teaching and, you know, sh shifting stuff forward in, in a structured way. But again, nice. it's, it's free to use. It's Creative Commons. We've developed it within the remit of the project, but it, I think it has a life way beyond that. And it's actually also been picked up by the, uh, the Learning for Sustainability group at the European level, they're using this for, for one of their activities already. So we're very pleased about that. Uh, it's one of the first outcomes of the project. Uh, what are we doing? When are we doing it? Okay, the first of the online activities will be in March. The first of the active learning um, environments are for primary teachers. And again, I, I hear what you're saying, Joachim, earlier about you know the need to work with primary schools and how challenging that can be and, and so on. We're delighted to have Santa Rem and Vienne on board in terms of steering the primary side of our work, uh, but we also have primary teachers. One of our third partner associate schools, because they couldn't become a full partner, 
um, for, for technical reasons, they're based in Austria, but they are an associate school and they're primary and they're helping us in terms of this is what's relevant for primary teachers. Uh, this is how we can kind of take that conversation forward. The second workshop then is in, uh, in May and then pushing through into the summer. The face to face for that is in uh, June. Then we have the second major work, uh, online workshop at, in June also, and the first of the spring schools stroke summer schools will be in Cyprus in this coming June um, into July. So we're very much looking forward to that because we'll have about 50 teachers from all over Europe. Um, so again, there's nothing like living Europe to teach Europe. So we will have perspectives from teachers and teacher educators from uh, five or six different countries uh, at that meeting. The following year, we have open calls. So we don't really know where the teachers will come from there. They will not come from within the partnership necessarily, but we are very confident that we'll have a series of, um, th there's a lot of interest already. And when we put the word out through the Erasmus channels, teachers are starting to find us and ask about, can we come to the workshops also? So our intention is in 2000, and, uh, uh, sorry, in 2024, to actually open up to teachers from all over the, the, uh, the union and indeed beyond. Uh, running on the model and running with the, 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 the polished and shiny version of the materials that we've trialed and tested the previous year. Now, I would also say that if anyone's interested in access to those materials, they will be open source and they'll be available. And each learning package will be structured in such a way that it can be used as the basis for a three credit um, um, uh, module in any higher education institution. Um, that's our, our kind of opening gambit, three to five credits for any of these learning activity packages. Um, connected with the, the work of the project. And this will be ECTS aligned. So it'll be usable in uh, institutions throughout the union. That's basically it in, in a nutshell. I'm very, very happy to take questions. I know that was a very quick kind of whistle stop uh, tour through it. But as I say, we have uh, Rachel Bowden, who's our coordinator in, in, in Dresden. We've been very capably led by Axel Gierman, who again is uh, as much of a Europeanist as anything else. And then I'm the PI here on the Ireland end of the project. So thank you for, for, for your time and attention. Uh, and as I say, I'm very happy to take questions or indeed abuse or whatever you want to, to throw in my direction in relation to the work. But the one final point I perhaps make is that we're one of three and we're delighted to be here today to, um, you know, to, to, to take part in the, the startup session for one of the other three projects. Mm -hmm. uh, so thank you, Christian, for your invitation. And uh, that's it, folks. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Connor. And that's it's great. We're back. So, so <laughs> very pleased. So, 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 so sorry. We thought this was just a test, um, but unfortunately, there was some problem. Uh, it wasn't a fire as far as I can tell, but some sort of issue that needed the authorities to sign something off before we're allowed back into the building. <laughs> but at least we're back now. Um, could somebody just uh, inform me where we are in the presentations, just so that I, I know what we've already um, continued. So Connor, you've um, continued and... I also have been a very capable chair in, in your absence and we've got the recordings going as well. So I'll leave it to John to take you through where we are. Fantastic. Yes, so um, <clears throat> I think we have um, concluded, and I guess, as you suggested, Connor, right there, um, you're more than willing to take questions. So perhaps uh, questions from our audience. Uh, Connor, uh, you were talking about the um, open source material. And I, I think one of the modules, D25, uh, dealing with climate disinformation. Mm. So just what, what would be uh, available for, for one of those modules, just uh, roughly? Okay, well, it, that, again, it's in draft version, and I can send you the, the outline for draft version, if you're particularly interested in. The, the pattern is much the same, because we've used that roadmap to design all of the materials. So basically, it would look like a, an introductory block of material with very, very carefully sourced um, introductory material, uh, introductory level ma material. So articles, papers from um, field journals in relation to environmental sustainability and in relation to disinformation, for example, in that particular case. Then we would have three what we call units where each 
uh, uh, where an aspect of the module is explored in depth and detail. Now, I don't know what Jerome is doing with that particular unit, but it's an interesting one because we're building on the work that's been done in relation to Polsock in Ireland for that specific unit. So we're taking some of the materials that um, were mentioned previously in terms of political science development in, in the Irish secondary level, and we're working with those to give them a more European relevance and, and reference set. So there are three units like that, and then there's a closeout unit. So the, the model is much the same for all of our learning and teaching packages. Each unit would be built around activities. And this is the key thing. I loved what you said, Niall, about, you know, keeping it open and keeping it task focused and everything else. Everything we do, it's not just information pumping. It's priming, then activities, deeper activities, and then a closing action, if you like. And with the emphasis on the closing action, getting people to go away and do stuff. Now, structuring this for teachers and for use in classrooms is what we're doing primarily. But we're also building in the necessary um, structure and the necessary levels of detail so that each of these learning packages can also be submitted to our individual institutions for a three credit to five credit um, module that, that can be used then by, by instructors. Everything we produce will be Creative Commons. That's the point. So whatever we produce at the end of the day will be available on the um, TAPTS website and anyone anywhere can take it and repurpose it and use it to their own ends. So that's our, that's our kind of, that was a key decision. And it's caused huge grief for my financial colleagues in UCD. They are having an absolute kitten about the whole thing. But, you know, look, this needs to be public. It needs to be available. There's no sense in having it proprietorial. And that was a key decision in terms of what we decided to do. Thanks. Thanks. Um, John, do you want to, have we time for more questions or Christy has a comment to make or, and, and, and Joachim are both. Yeah, well, more than a comment, it's just because I was <laughs> interrupted due to the fire alarm in the middle of what I was supposed to present on. Of course, they're not going to uh, do everything at, at this stage, otherwise it would be too long. But maybe just to focus on some key takeaways, not on substance, but on how to teach EU law, EU studies, and especially in a, in a complex field like banking and finance, for instance. Um, so the fact that um, it's important to know what the law is about, so that would, what we'll be calling substantive law, but I think even more important to know the tools, to have the skills and resources to look for specific answers when you're facing some specific problems. And, and here in banking and finance, you have a single rule book, so there has been a lot of changes over the last uh, 14, 12 years, and it's uh, continuing, and you have an inflation of rules, so there is absolutely no point to kind of cover this exhaustively, but rather to look at specific problems. And here, this is uh, what we call uh, problem-based learning or challenge-based learning. You, you um, explain this, the exact situation, what the problem is, and then um, go through solutions, potential solutions with the students, uh, keeping making them aware of uh, how the law is adopted, made, but also its interpretation and application in, in our society. And this is where I, I was uh, saying maybe my title could have been also uh, with law in context. So the fact that it's informed by a broader context and being aware of, of some other challenges. And maybe then one last thing, it's about the learning activities. And here I would second what Connor was just pointing at. Um, so uh, the situational analysis that I just mentioned, maybe some mood exercises. So here it can be mood court, but also mood parliaments. I've, I've, as a student myself, I learned a lot just being in an exercise where uh, we would do EU lawmaking. And here we are able to deconstruct some complex institutional setting. And, and this is very, very useful. Um, and and trying to be at different levels at the same time. So lawmaking, but also some substantive elements uh, within a specific field. And, and there, uh, maybe three more examples. So study trip and field trip. So this is something I have in my uh, Jean Monnet module at the moment. And I think this would be also a great learning activity. Um, and maybe a more controversial proposition here that I would put on the table for me. <laughs> We're reaching the end of the session, but the, the, the placement. So some uh, like um, traineeship, but also um, maybe some visitings, and here I would speak about the students themselves, but even us, I think, uh, as professors, the teachers themselves, because in some fields, um, I mean, my teaching is deeply um, uh, influenced and, and has benefited from 
uh, an experience that I had at DCB itself. And I wouldn't be teaching the same way. I wouldn't have had this on-site experience within the institution. So uh, these were the elements I wanted to, to share with you. Of course, it's in a very um, much constrained way because of timing, but uh, yeah, here, here, here it is. I think we're kind of out of time. So uh, it, it, welcome. If it's, if it's a question for me, I, I'm happy to take it offline at some stage. So thank you. John or, or Christian, whoever is uh, chairing, it's, it's back to you, sir. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody, for this fantastic panel. Um, I'm very sorry that we could only hear half of it. But uh, thank you very much also, John, for, for taking the reins and chairing this panel. That's, that's been very, very much appreciated. So without further ado, I want us to go to the keynote lecture um, that John will be providing. It will be on Ireland and the European Union, 1973 to 2023, from the margins to the center of Europe. But before we start, let me just give you a very, very brief outline of John's biography. John is a professor within the Department of Sociology at Maynooth University. He also holds a Jomoni Chair in European Integration and is a director of the Maynooth Center for European and Eurasian Studies. His work focuses largely on European Union institutions and politics. He looks specifically on the process and politics of EU enlargement policy. And of course, he has been writing specifically here also on Ireland's relationship with the European Union, where he finishes a monograph that examines exactly this experience that Ireland has had uh, as, as an EU member state for the 50 years since its accession in 1973. In addition to that, he's also a board member and current vice president of the Irish Association for Contemporary European Studies, IASIS, and a member of the Irish government since 2017, and a member of the Irish Institute for European and International Affairs Global Europe Group. His work encompasses a number of different things. He's also the co-PI with his colleague on a new 2022 to 2024 project examining the impact of gambling advertising on young people in Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. So now, without further ado, I hand over to you, John. Thank you very much. We're delighted to have you. Um, thank you very much, Christian. Just before we begin, I would like to upload um, a PowerPoint. Um, I've been on leave for a while, so um, I have no idea. I can't remember how I share the screen. So maybe you would just um, uh, advise bottom, me about sharing. You should have a, a button share screen at the bottom of your screen. Um, no, I can't see it. It's beside the chat button. There's first participant, then chat, and then share screen after that. Sometimes you have to make uh, the, the, the size of the window big so that you can see all the buttons. Yeah, I've done that and I just can't see it. Mm -hmm. um, it's in between I... the chat and the recording. It should be in between those two. Um, I know I, I don't see it there, Christian. I'm sorry. Hmm. Uh, this this the symbol in green does share only green color. It's yeah. the um. It's where. It should be in green. There should be, like the button is in green, while all the other buttons are kind of. Uh, Great. Um, no, there's nothing like that. Um, could I just send it to you by email? Oh, if you, if you, you send it to me, it. then I'll, I'll upload it. Apologies to everybody no for worries. the delay.
Have you sent it? Sorry, Christian, my system is incredibly slow. Um, I am just getting to it now. No worries, no worries. So in the meantime, I see a, a question about um, teaching in ULO, perhaps for Niall or Christy or anybody who would like to uh, answer it perhaps in the chat box. So does the fact, I think that Ireland is not the only common law member state present particular difficulties in teaching EU law. Um, Christy, any thoughts on that? Yeah, so um, I would say it can be a challenge, but I think we can relate with, I mean, in terms of interpretation and the importance of case law, because this is something we have that is very important in EU law too, no? The, the precedents, and, and this is something that uh, from the common law system, you would understand really well. So uh, from this perspective, you can turn the, 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 the challenge as an opportunity, so to say. Uh, but then I think um, another point I would make here is that the comparative perspective is always an asset too, uh, to understand at different levels. So here between common and continental law approaches, but also maybe at different levels, because as you know, I mean, uh, national law has still a very important role to implement or to, um, you know, at a different level than EU law. So um, rather than a difficulty, I would say it added an interesting additional layer that also um, helped us as professor um, to distinguish between uh, lawmaking, the application of law and its interpretation. I think this is the way I would see it. Maybe Niall, you have uh, other views on that. Being so also, we have a background here because I, I'm from the continental law system. So. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I suppose with um, with international trade law, when I'm teaching it, I I, I try to situate it within public international law, so um, that that conflict between common law and civil law is, is less pronounced. When I have taught EU law in in the past, um, it, it is uh, yeah definitely a point uh, that you know I emphasise that. You know the judges at the ECJ are coming from different legal cultures, etc. Et um, but I, um, I, I, I try to just view EU law, you know, as it is, as it is written, to focus on 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 the the content of it, rather than overly emphasising, you know, the different legal traditions that the community come from. Um, Thank you. Um, so over to you, John. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Sarah. May I thank you and Christian for inviting me to give this talk. I'm very pleased to do so and um, really wish the Academy the very best of luck in the years to come. Um, now, I've given versions of this talk uh, over the last few months in Bulgaria, Croatia, Germany, France, Romania, and recently in the United States a couple of weeks ago. This is the first time uh, I've delivered it to an Irish audience, so I'm particularly keen to get people's uh, perspectives. I'm assuming that most people have a broad knowledge of the contours of Ireland's uh, journey within the integration process over these uh, 50 years or so. Um, I'm not sure if I'll have to ask Christian to just move the slides on because I don't have control. Um, uh, thanks. I think it's worth reminding ourselves at the outset. No, and what I'm going to do is to focus on what I think are the most important elements of membership. And I hope to be somewhat provocative as well. Um, it's worth recalling however at the outset that the Irish state is just over 100 years old. The uh, European Union has been part of our lives for exactly half of that period of independence. And I think it's true to say that whether it's attributable to the EU or not, that most of the social, economic and political transformation evident in Ireland coincides with this period of membership. One of the tasks I think we have as researchers is to try and, when we look at this 50 year period, to disentangle the purely EU effects when we're thinking about transformation from the 
effects that are more uh, closely associated with globalization on the one hand and with domestic processes of change and reform. However, my overall argument is yes, indeed, EU membership has been transformative for Ireland, if indeed not exactly in the ways that were anticipated in the early 1970s. You'll be clearer about that, I think, about my view of this as we uh, move along. Uh, okay, uh, can we just move on uh, the slides? Thanks. Um, I think it's true to say that whatever way you slice and dice it, Ireland has had this extraordinary journey within Europe since 1973. We have moved in these five decades from being the poorest of the rich in 1973 to being amongst the richest of the 27 member states in 2023. And the transformations associated with European integration have been multiple and overlapping in economic, social, and institutional terms. And although membership is not solely responsible for the scale of change seen in Ireland, as in other member states, um, I think we can convincingly assert that the European Union has been a big part of the kind of changes that we've seen in our economy and in society uh, over this period of time. Next slide, thanks. Um, I just wanted to focus briefly at the outset on the transactional dimension of membership. And in the uh, introductory slide, the term I use is this question, has Ireland moved over the period of membership from the periphery of the then European community to the center or the core of the European Union of today, question mark. And I suggest that there has certainly been a lot of movement in that direction. And you can see this in all kinds of different ways. One of them is to just focus on the money. And I think for a long time in Ireland, we had this mentality, which was transactional and kind of utilitarian in its nature. And the EU was viewed almost exclusively through this lens of how much money is being extracted from it. But whatever the nature of those arguments, it's very clear that over a very long period of time, Ireland has been the recipient of extraordinary amounts of subvention. In the early stages of membership, it was associated with the common agricultural policy, represented here in green. Uh, this begins to change in the late 1980s. It then becomes much more about regional policy. Um, but over that period of time, we have seen extraordinary inflows of European money the greatest sort of effort of redistribution we've ever seen in a regional uh, body in the modern era. Just to move on, Sarah, thank you very much. So over that period of time, um, Ireland, I, I think up till about 2014, was a, a net recipient from the EU budget that changed around 2014, 15, and we are now contributing three to 500 million euros per year approximately to that budget. But if you look at the overall net revenue, it amounts to something like 40 billion euros. So uh, every year we were in receipt of about 800 million euros or so going back to those initial years in the early 1970s. Now that is, an extraordinary sum for a country that was extremely underdeveloped and geographically and in market terms quite peripheral to the core of the European community as it existed in those early days. But my argument is that this is far from being uh, the only significant factor that accounts for Ireland's economic advance within the Union. Next slide. Thanks, Sarah. And in fact, uh, I think the subvention 
uh, has to be viewed in the much wider context. And for me, it is the single market. Uh, I argue that Ireland has been one of the greatest beneficiaries of the single European Act and the single European market program associated with it. And there's an irony in this, because if you go back and look at the debates that were taking place in Ireland before the ratification of the single act, there was a lot of hesitancy in business in, and in industry, which had been continued to some degree to be protected after membership in 1973. There was a suspicion about what exposure to uh, competition within the envisaged single market, what that might bring to Ireland. And this was in a context where I would also argue that we had largely wasted the first 15 years of membership. Yes, there had been a lot of subvention coming in through the cap, Yes, that certainly boosted incomes in rural parts of Ireland. But in the 1980s, whatever efforts we were making within that context to transform ourselves were completely compromised by the political stasis and the mismanagement of the economy, which saw uh, budget deficits over 10% on a regular basis the GDP, debt to GDP ratio going above 100%. And of course, the human impact of all of this was a huge level of unemployment, about 20% in the late 1980s, 50,000 people per year were leaving the country. Um, many people will remember Joe Lee's epic book about 20th century Ireland. He was writing it just as this, um, very, very pessimistic sort of economic climate dominated. And his view and that of many people at the time was that firstly, um, had Irish independence even been worth it? And secondly, had European community membership really made that much of a difference? But my argument is that things changed very dramatically around 1987. And this is the key juncture, I think, where the change in Ireland's relationship with the EU happens. Partly it's because domestic politics settles down as a result of the Tala strategy, coalition government after 1987, the austerity that was imposed in an effort to get a grip on the public finances. But it is also because we really didn't anticipate how beneficial the single market might be to Ireland in the years ahead. And a lot of the academic research that's been done suggests that in, uh, along with Germany, the Netherlands, Belgium, Austria, Ireland has been one of the principal winners from the deepening of market integration that takes place after 1992. And certainly we know that the Irish export performance uh, really begins to improve dramatically in the late 1980s. And, and in particular, US multinationals saw the benefit of investing and basing themselves in Ireland as a key location uh, for projecting into um, the developing single European market. So that juncture of 1987 is particularly important. The next slide, thanks, Sarah. We should also, of course, remember that this is exactly the period when European regional policy changes decisively, partly because the poorer members of the EU, including Ireland and the Mediterranean states, Greece, Portugal and Spain, the recent entrance to the community, all argued that it would be much more difficult for them to converge with the EU norms um, without significant financial support. So this is the context in which the Delors reforms were agreed and are implemented after 1988. And it sees this vast and unprecedented supranational transfer of wealth from the richer member states to the poorer member states to help them adjust to the competitive demands of the single market. Now, these transfers took different forms. They were more 
in the form of grants rather than loans, and they were meant to improve key infrastructure and regional competitiveness. I well remember in the late 1990s, Ed Walsh, the president of the University of Limerick, saying that increasingly Ireland has a Silicon Valley economy and a Sicilian infrastructure. He was talking about the dreadful road system and everything else. Now, all of that was just beginning to take off largely as a result of this turbo boost that the subvention associated with the Delore reforms actually brought. And again, looking at the evidence from scholars of regional policy, it does appear that Ireland was very successful in using European funding for economic development in essentially helping to seed the economic recovery that begins to take off after 1998. So this conjunction of a much more favorable and peaceful domestic politics, along with the transformational potential of the single European Act, plus the Delors reforms, they all combine to provide this tremendous boost to the Irish economy and to lay the base for the economic liftoff that takes place in the 1990s. The next slide, thanks, Sarah. Um, you get a sense of this, I think, if you look at FDI. Um, I noted yesterday that the IDA released their uh, 2022 report, and it shows that direct employment uh, uh, in um, multinational corporations in Ireland that are associated with high levels of FDI, that figure has now gone over 300,000 for the first time. So it's a very significant chunk of the workforce. These are usually high paying jobs, relatively evenly distributed around the country. And my argument is that none of that would have been possible without this combination of the single European Act coming in when it did in 1993 and the injection that the Delors reforms provided, the seed funding that made so much of that uh, building out of Irish infrastructure possible. Thanks, uh, Sarah. Let's move on. Uh, again, I'm not going to dwell on the figures too much, but I, I think people know the story um, that um, even in the context of everything that Ireland had to cope with after the financial crash in 2008, the um, story of economic transformation has continued and indeed accelerated. And you can see it in all kinds of uh, indicators. Um, this one focuses on the Human Development Index. Ireland ranked second in 2020 in this uh, UN ranking, and it's supported by all kinds of other data that similarly sees us ranked uh, very highly in socioeconomic figures. And it's also, of course, uh, partly about globalization. Ireland is one of consistently ranked as one of the most globalized countries in the world. Uh, the next slide, Sarah, which I think is GDP. We all know there's an issue with the measurement of GDP per capita in Ireland. It would probably be better to use GNI star as the more accurate measurement of relative wealth. Uh, but even if we use the GNI star um, MEC denominator, um, you can still see that the Irish level of income per capita is significantly beyond the European Union average, not as high as the 221% uh, for GDP. If you strip out the distorting effects of transfer pricing by multinationals, we are still ranked within the top two or three uh, countries in the European Union. Thanks, Sarah. Okay, um, now this is a, the sense I think in which we have to begin kind of disentangling Europe from all of this. Um, some would argue that European integration might be viewed as a subset of globalization to the extent that it favors market integration, the opening of markets, the reduction of trade barriers and so forth. 
Um, however, the Irish case, I think, is interesting because it suggests that there's a compatibility between building the global Ireland approach <coughs> and the fundamentals of uh, the integration process. And here, just in passing to mention um, uh, a very uh, familiar argument to some that began to circulate and take off in the early 2000s, Mary Harney, that then tarnished uh, when she was reflecting on the change in Ireland circumstance, she argued that it was much more about Boston than Berlin. In other words, Ireland's connections to and cultivation of US foreign direct investment was really about the Irish US relationship and what we were doing domestically and had very little to do with Europe. Now, I think that was at the time very unconvincing and perhaps an entirely mistaken equivalence. Bridget Laffin has argued, and I think she's exactly right in suggesting <coughs> that it was because of Berlin that Boston was possible. In other words, all of that extraordinary upsurge in US FDI into Ireland was really possible because of our position within a single market that was deepening and that was offering more and more opportunities, especially if we think about the enlargement of the union after 2004. So the deepening and widening of the EU um, is a better um, explanatory factor, I think Bridget is saying, and many of us would argue, than suggesting that there was something unique about the Irish-American relationship or that whatever we were doing domestically accounted for this success in garnering this kind of investment. The next slide, thanks, Sarah. Now, of course, there are other factors that we need to think about. And that if we're trying to suggest Ireland as a success story within the European Union, perhaps differentiate Ireland from some other member states. Um, first, there was a sustained investment in education from the 1960s onwards, whether it was in the guise of free secondary school education under Donald O'Malley, through to the investment in third level in the 1990s, there's this consistency about education as supporting economic development. And I think that has to be understood as part of this uh, advance that we can uh, suggest that Ireland has made. Um, it's also true that the focus on FDI is one that did not begin with the single market and didn't really begin even with membership. We can go back to 1959 to the economic development uh, document to what um, Lamas and Whitaker were trying to do in opening the country to uh, foreign investment in what had hitherto been a very, very protected market. And you can see the sort of underpinnings or the seeding of the later success there. Um, we could also cite corporation tax. There are many people outside of Ireland who would say, well, most of your success is actually attributable to this huge competitive gain that you uh, accumulated because of low corporate tax. I don't think this is true. Number one, lots of other member states have gone down that route and they haven't had the same experience as Ireland. And secondly, we actually had an even lower rate of corporate tax prior to entering the European community in 1973. So I've never believed that the corporate tax explanation is one that's satisfactory when it tries to account for what's happened over these five decades or so. More important, I would argue, uh, and very much in uh, connected to that period in 1987-88 is the model of social partnership which was adopted in Ireland, a conscious adoption of a European model, if you like, and it's one I think most people would suggest has served the country pretty well since uh, it was adopted more than 30 years ago. And just to make an obvious comparison, look at all the industrial relations turmoil in the United Kingdom. 
currently and all of the stoppages and strikes that UK citizens are facing because you have a very confrontational model of industrial relations. Here, certainly um, different groups and trade unions have argued for um, significant increases in salary for their members and so on. But we have just seen the uh, latest sort of public partnership model see a very important agreement between the public sector unions and the government. It's entirely different to uh, the UK. Finally, um, I, we have to uh, acknowledge that Ireland has constituted a kind of bridge between the US and Europe, and I'll come back to that a little bit later. So all of that really is about economic transformation. And I'm arguing that the European Union has been the most important factor. I'm not for a moment dismissing all these purely domestic or global level factors that also contributed to these changes. But for me, it is European integration that stands out. Second, um, I want to make an argument about the change in Irish mindsets that has happened during this period of membership. So this is really about the psychological change that takes place in Ireland as a result of membership. Now, this is a very difficult argument, I think, for social scientists to make because so much of this is intangible, um, but bear with me. Uh, I go back first to 1979 and to the break with Sterling. Before that, the Irish punt had been um, absolutely connected to the pound sterling. And so whatever movement sterling was experiencing in currency markets internationally, Ireland would be subject to those kind of fluctuations. When the decision was made in 1979 to join the European monetary system, Garrett Fitzgerald, our former Taoiseach, argued that however important this was in preparing the way for Ireland to join the Eurozone later, it was actually psychologically the break with Britain, the break with the Anglosphere, or from this excessive attachment to the UK. Because one of the most depressing features of those first 50 or 60 years of independence, surely was the fact that you know, by the time we entered the European community in 1973, we still sent more than 50% of everything we produced to the UK. So we really hadn't been very successful at diverging from the UK, uh, despite those 50, 60, almost 70 years or so. So that breakaway from the Anglosphere, I think, was very important moving us to a much more cosmopolitan, nuanced and <coughs> multifarious identity landscape. Now, this terrain is genuinely complex and I am not arguing that Ireland sort of neatly moves from the Anglo world to the European world. Um, what I'm saying is that there are complex patterns that we can point to in respect of educational experiences of settlement of Irish people in different European jurisdictions, travel, as well as the deep economic inter interdependence that is being encouraged by market integration. And I would add to that more recently, the extraordinary change in the nature of the Irish population. 25 years ago, we had a largely homogenous population Today, 15% of the Irish population um, was born outside of the state. That's been an extraordinary change. And in good part, that has been about the inward migration to Ireland of people from other European Union member states. So putting all of this together, I'm arguing that over time, slowly and incrementally, there has been a change in the thinking of Irish people about where we belong. And if we move along, Sarah, um, I'll say some more about this when we move to Brexit. But just to briefly um, mention 
how this is all reflected in the redirection of trade. This is the divergence or coming out of the shadow of the United Kingdom. You can see it perfectly mapped in the way our um, trade has changed over the course of these 50 years. Uh, from 1973, when we sent just 13% of what we produced to the EEC, 60% or so to the UK. By 1997, that figure had reduced to 26%. And by 2021, that had reduced to just 8% of overall EU exports. Brexit, of course, is very important in accelerating further. But that change had been going on incrementally over a long period of time. And I think it's worth mentioning in the context of this much broader kind of change in Irish attitudes to Europe and to the world. Next slide, thanks, Sarah. Now linked to this, uh, another key argument that I'm making in the book that I'm writing currently, which will come out in the autumn of 2023, is that over time we have seen a distinct change in the attitude of Irish elites in particular to the European Union. So that phrase that I used or that word that I used in the title from the periphery, I think is really important here because for much of the period of membership, our elites seem to ground themselves cognitively in this peripheral place. In other words, that our geography and our geographic peripherality in European terms almost defined who we were and defined our relationships within Europe. Now, that was also, I think, reflected in the very transactional approach that we had to the European Union. Going back to uh, Professor Laffin, you may remember at one point in the 1990s, she summed this up in one journal article uh, this is part of the title, I think, which said, if you're over there in Brussels, will you get me a grant? So our, our attitude to Europe was functional, it was material, largely about what we could extract from it. And I'm not saying that Ireland was distinctly different from other member states, because that transactional approach uh, is one that I think has been widely kind of shared. But what I'm saying is that over the last two decades, and despite the enormous volatility brought by two failed referendums on Europe in 2001, 2008, and by the Eurozone crisis in 2009, despite all of that, there is now a much more nuanced approach to Europe in evidence amongst Irish elites. Um, as evidence for this, I think we're much more willing now to take a lead or to sign up to important sub-EU groups. I mentioned the, Han the New Hanseatic League, for example. Um, there are others that we could point to similarly that all indicate that Irish elites no longer see themselves as peripheral, but increasingly as part of this developing center or core of the European Union. And needless to say, Brexit made that explicit choice for Europe an unequivocal one. If there was any doubt, in other words, um, or any ambiguity about where Ireland's most important geopolitical anchor lay, I think it, it disappeared after the Brexit vote in 2016. Uh, if we could move on, Sarah, thank you. Um, just to make a comparison, and I've been looking at a lot of the documentation from the 1970s, 80s and 90s, but I would just direct people to two sources. You could look at Albert Reynolds and um, the kind of commentary that took place when he came back from the Edinburgh European Council summit in 1992. It was all about how many billion Ireland had secured from the budgetary negotiations. Uh, again, that's a pretty normal thing, you might argue, in European terms. But in Ireland, it was the primary lens, I would argue, through which 
the EU was viewed for a long time. You can compare it to Leo Varadkar's speech to the European Parliament in early 2018. And there, I think, you, you get a much more expansive sense of what Europe is to Irish policymakers and to Irish elites. And I think that's indicative of this kind of cumulative and important generational change. But it's also about the immersion of Irish people in EU spaces of different kinds over a long uh, period of time. Uh, it is cumulative, but I think the evidence is very decisive that there is a pronounced change in mentality from that one of peripherality in the initial stages of membership to one where Irish people now increasingly see themselves as being part of the core of the integration model. The next slide, thanks, Sarah. We are moving now towards a conclusion. One other lesson, I think, to be learned uh, or, or important observation, it can be both actually from the Irish experience, uh, is that European Union membership does not solve all your problems. Now here I'm pointing to the depiction frequently of Ireland as a model pupil within the states that joined the European communities after 1973. Ireland was perceived to have been a pronounced success story. That wasn't the case for many other member states. I well remember from 20 years ago onwards, when I would visit Central and East European countries frequently, there was this distinct admiration for Ireland, number one, and what had been achieved and this desire to emulate the Irish performance. What were the things that you really got right and how can we uh, do similar things in Estonia, Latvia, Bulgaria or whatever? However, I would always say um, to those kind of audiences, we know that membership doesn't magically solve problems of domestic economy and politics. We made a lot of mistakes in the course of our membership for example, in my view, we cannot blame any European authorities for what happened in Ireland after 2008. It was mismanagement of the economy, pure and simple, by uh, domestic forces. Uh, that isn't to say that there isn't a lot of blame that should attach to the EU for the imposition of austerity. I think that that's very clear. However, the overall conclusion that I come to is that membership actually, if you're smart about it, it adds value to domestic efforts of transformation. In many other member states, I think, particularly recent entrants, there was a sense that the EU was the panacea that would solve the problems of underdevelopment and so on. It isn't. It is something that provides all kinds of instruments which help to add value to domestic efforts of economic and market transformation in particular. Next slide, Sarah, thank you. <clears throat> um, just a final few words on Brexit. And here, I'm not so much interested in the negotiations and what has ensued, but rather in how all of this has resulted in a repositioning of Ireland within the European Union. Firstly, there was Herculean diplomatic efforts made after 23rd of June 2016. I think people are more than aware of that, where our diplomats would literally fan out to all of the member state capitals to explain exactly what was at stake in Northern Ireland and why it was so existential to uh, the island of Ireland. However, at European level, um, it's been very interesting to observe this sense that prior to Brexit, Ireland had actually been in a very kind of settled and I would say complacent posture about its bilateral relationships within the EU. Uh, there was a sense in which we had allowed many of these to atrophy. Uh, they were the subject of neglect over a long period of time. However, 
Brexit really provided this incentive to change all of that. We had to essentially rebuild relations with many member states. And I think this is reflected now in the new impetus we can see attached to, for example, German-Irish relations and French-Irish relations. In the case of Germany, a new German-Irish Economic Council, a new Irish consulate in Frankfurt, uh, new German-Irish cultural linkages, and so on. This is all reflective of this post-Brexit reflection on where Ireland sits in Europe, a sense that we were definitely losing something in losing the United Kingdom as an ally, particularly on market and competition issues within the EU, and that we had to try harder to cultivate other member states and to ensure that our interests could be protected issue by issue across the EU. So this calibration or recalibration of where Ireland sits within the EU has been, I think, really important and will continue to be in the years to come. And the, the last slide, I think, Sarah. Sorry, I wanted to say a few words about public opinion. Um, I'm not going to dwell on this. There may be questions. Um, but just to say that, I mean, everybody is aware, and we can look at the next slide, Sarah, of how strong public support for Europe is in Ireland. I don't think there's much doubt that Brexit has copper fastened and reinforced that uh, sense of belonging to the EU and support for the institutions. However, um, I don't think there's any reason to be complacent about this. There were similarly strong uh, Eurobarometer figures of public support for membership prior to the Nice Treaty referendum in 2001, and again, Lisbon in 2008. Our politicians were incredibly complacent, I thought, in respect of both of those referendums and thought that, you know, there was a settled consensus in the country and that they no longer had to make the case for Europe. <coughs> well, this isn't true. There is no permissive consensus anymore within the EU and governments have to continually make the arguments for Europe. And I have been one of those people in Ireland who've been very critical over a long period of time about the way we talk about and project and communicate Europe. I don't think government has been anything like as serious enough about this. We had a little conversation earlier about this, about the falling numbers of Irish nationals uh, who are applying for and securing positions within the European institutions. The figures are very dramatic. We're facing a cliff edge, which is very worrying to the government. We have lots of officials due to retire by 2025, and we're not recruiting anything like enough younger people um, to go into the institutions to provide Ireland with the kind of representation that government believes is uh, important in defending our interests kind of in the macro sense. Now, there, there has been a change here. I think the government is doing some things, but to go back to our previous conversation, I think Joachim and Connor and others are absolutely right. We need to do much, much more at school level in particular to try and at least inculcate um, conversations about Europe and about why European Union membership matters uh, for Ireland. Some of this is taking place uh, at primary level, not nearly enough. It's beginning to happen at second level, not nearly enough yet. And I would say that within the third level system, we haven't had anything like the level of support that we should have had from government over a long period of time. And while I really welcome the addition of the uh, academy at DCU, the other um, teaching projects that Connor mentioned, as well as the Jean Monnet chairs and centers of excellence. By the way, none of that was there 10 years ago. There had been a real dip within the Irish education, higher education system in um, applications to Erasmus Plus. And I'm really glad that that has been completely reversed now, but we could do with a lot more support 
from government to help maintain or to advance master's programs and other things of that kind. In other words, we should not take EU membership for granted. And, and the particular reason for this is well known to everybody, I think, that um, Ireland is the only member state which is compelled to hold referendums on any EU treaty change that results after IGCs or conversations at European level. We will have future referendums and I hope we will never again see the complacency we saw in 01 and in 08. But the only way that you can effectively communicate Europe is to do it permanently, not intermittently. Referendums should not be like cramming for an exam in the way that many of our students are doing right now. Um, there should be a permanent basis of communication uh, around Europe. In my own case, I'm a great fan of the Citizens' Assembly model. I think we should have a permanent Citizens' Assembly on Europe, and that would, I think, help at least to reduce the uh, potential dangers that exist around misinformation and other things. Final one, Sarah. Um, sorry, I'm going to skip past security and defense because I know I've gone over time. I'll just go to the final. We can certainly come back to it in questions. Um, we can just go to the very final concluding slide, if you will. Okay. Um, just to say this, that um, the Irish experience of 50 years of integration hasn't all been plain sailing. There have been periods of distinct tension with Brussels and with some key EU capitals. For the most part, however, I think Ireland has actually used its membership very smartly. It's good, I suppose, that uh, European integration has aligned in very compatible terms with the kind of pro-globalization policies pursued by successive governments here. Um, some people might argue that um, in respect to redistribution and so on, that those things have brought lots of negatives. I don't disagree with that. But I think it's undoubtedly true to say that membership has been truly transformative for Ireland not quite in the ways that were originally envisaged and that Brexit really did confirm the Irish choice for European integration and for the EU as its core geopolitical anchor in the world. Thanks very much indeed. And happy to take questions. Right, thank you, thanks very much. That's been a really, really great lecture. I think we've all learned quite a lot. And thank you so much for, for all of that. I see at least two hundred. So I think Paul was first and then Ian. Thanks very much. Could I just uh, compliment John on an absolutely excellent presentation? And I agree with every word of it, having experienced most of it myself. I just like to make three very short points from the point of view of the Department of Finance and from within the Department of Finance. First of all, was the social transformation that John referred to. Um, I've had direct experience with that from within finance and the Department of Social Welfare in the um, uh, social welfare system, the contributory system, which we had to restructure completely uh, because it was gender based and uh, we had to restructure that completely um, uh, because of EU non-discrimination stuff. And, and that, of course, led to looking at, at, at the thing overall. The second thing that we experienced was very strong, and that was the psychological dependence on the British. Um, best practice was always Whitehall. That, that was gone. But one of the <coughs> huge contributors to that was the rotating presidency because the EU, the, the UK, instead of being the daddy, uh, became just one of the other people at the table. And you, you, you had to get consensus among the other member states with, uh, at the end of a meeting, and they were only one. And, and this, this led to a total transformation, I think, in, in our sort of attitudes. And the, the final thing is in the question of planning and programming. Um, we, we, we had all this stuff, I'll grant you, with the first, second, third programs and stuff like that, which is where I 
which is where I come in. The, these were largely indicative. But once the EU structural funds came in with cohesion um, and, and, and the regional funds and the social funds, then there had to be real planning because the EU came and said, what have you done with the money and show us? And they had a system of monitoring committees and so forth. And I was the uh, Southern per person responsible for the EU uh, peace program in Northern Ireland. I experienced this. And like there was an element of terror the night before the monitoring committee meetings because the commission was there and they took you to pieces. Now, we, 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 we were, weren't too unhappy with that because we were getting loads of dash from the EU anyway, and they were lovely people. But the Northern Irish people, incident, uh, inter interestingly enough, resented this enormously because they were, <laughs> net, they were net contributors and they saw the Commission coming along telling them how to spend their money. You know, and uh, it, it was an interesting uh, thing. But I, just to support John's thesis in those, in those three particular points, thank you. Thanks a lot. So then Ian and afterwards Joachim. Uh, thank you. And I want to thank John for an excellent lecture. Very, very interesting. Um, uh, I guess I have a quite a simple question, and that is, um, it's quite likely that uh, after the next election, we're going to have Sinn Féin in government for the first time in the history of the state. Um, uh, and, and I'm wondering, and of course, Sinn Féin is an outlier uh, amongst <laughs> Irish parties. It's uh, traditionally been a Eurosceptic party, though I think that that's been changing over time. Um, and so I'm wondering whether whether this consensus um, about uh, the way to, to kind of deal with the EU that has kind of been stable over uh, many decades, whether that will change with the Sinn Féin government. Great. And then I take Joachim and then I'll give back to John. Yeah, um, a question for, for John. I, I really uh, enjoyed your excellent uh, look back. If I asked you about the future, uh, uh, what, uh, what, what is your sense? Uh, where do Irish people would like the EU to go? Uh, we, are, uh, we, uh, we are at a certain point in, in history. I never get a sense clearly uh, what um, what Irish people would like to get out of uh, the EU? I, I can uh, I can see a lot of reactions. We don't want uh, the the uh, the, the um, corporation tax to change. We don't want that. We do do want that. Um, but what would they like to do? Uh, there seems to be a very small spectrum of opinion and not much of a debate. Uh, and I'm never quite sure whether there is a serious uh, federalist. Uh, um, section uh, sector of uh, public opinion uh, which th uh, there clearly is in virtually well in many other member states thank you and back to you john okay thanks um well thanks to paul uh for his comments um they were comments rather than questions um ian on Sinn Féin in government well I think there's so many fascinating questions that um, might be considered here. Um, you look at opinion polls and uh, up till I suppose about two weeks ago, it looked like Sinn Féin was kind of cresting at 36, 37%. It goes back in one poll to about 34. But prior to that, I was, I kind of had the sense that the unthinkable might happen. Supposing we have a really difficult winter and we're going through a very difficult weather week currently, which brings everything in relation to energy use and cost and so forth into play. Um, if they were at 36, 37 in September, where might they be in March or April if we had a very difficult winter? I'm sure you know that there is a vulnerability about Irish um, electricity supply because of the interconnector and you know the various dependencies. And so I had the view that it wasn't inconceivable that Sinn Féin might be in overall majority territory. Now that would be extraordinary given everything that's happened over the last 30 years or so in Irish politics. I don't think anybody expected any party to be close to uh, a overall majority. But 
that's where I thought we might be heading and we still might be heading. Now that, by the way, I think presents a real problem for Sinn Féin because the closer they are to an overall majority, the more pressure there will be from some parts of their electorate for a referendum. And I think, frankly, the Sinn Féin leadership is terrified at the prospect of a premature referendum on a United Ireland. Um, similarly, on Europe, try to imagine a scenario where um, two and a bit years from now, they end up on 71, 72 seats, and they're then dependent on largely left-wing groups and independents in the Doyle. That would mean that their socialism would be tested. And let's remember, they've never been tested in power at all. So we simply don't know how they would behave in power. I, I think either of those scenarios would be a headache. I think their preference would be to have Fianna Fáil as the junior party in a coalition, because then they you know, would be able to essentially uh, avoid um, implementing many of the commitments in their manifesto. But specifically on Europe, I think there has been a change. If some people may have watched the very interesting conversation between Mary Lou MacDonald and Bridget Laffan uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, if you haven't, I think it's well worth examining. Um, Mary Lou MacDonald has a master's in European integration. I think that's not insignificant here. She also, of course, served as an MEP. Um, and I think you're, you're right, Ian, there has been a discernible change in the language that Sinn Féin has been using, not in their election manifestos, they've tended to just cut and paste those in recent times. But I was really struck last week, um, or was it the previous week, previous week when Ursula von der Leyen made her um, speech to both houses of the Oireachtas, Mary Lou Macdonald's response to her was really warm. Um, you know, it, com compared to what it might have been 10 years ago, it was astonishing. Uh, so Brexit really did bring Sinn Féin into the mainstream, I think, of Irish party political thinking on Europe. Whether that holds or not, I think, is another question. The most obvious test of this is on neutrality. And we're seeing so many accelerated developments in Europe as a result of the war in Ukraine. We just don't know where we're going to be two years from now. And for me, Sinn Féin in power, whether on their own or in coalition, um, the greatest point of contention would probably be security and defense. Um, I think on lots of other areas, you're likely to see a softening of Sinn Féin positions. In other words, they're, they're more at ease with market forces than many people I think understand that a lot of what they do domestically is entirely performative politics and you could look for example at their relationship with and cultivation of the U.S. multinational sector. They've been very adroit at doing that in recent years and that suggests to me that there isn't going to be any fundamental change in Ireland's position if uh, they acquire power. But I think the key thing will be whether it's in coalition with Fianna Fáil or Fine Gael, much more likely to be Fianna Fáil, or whether they end up short of an overall majority and they are then dependent on a range of different independents and or probably left-wing uh, political parties in the Dáil. That would be much more unsatisfactory, I think, and potentially much more destabilizing of Ireland's relationship with the EU. But if it's likely to be in coalition with Fianna Fáil, I honestly don't see much evidence that anything very much is going to change. Uh, to Joachim's question about what Irish people would uh, like to get out of the EU, um, well, I was very struck in von der Leyen's speech how much she emphasized what Ireland contributes to the EU, because this is a question we actually rarely ask. And it was interesting to see that it was the president of the commission 
no doubt with the help of Irish speech writers who was talking about the Irish uh, contributions when she mentioned the the saw doctors for example I knew that there had to be an Irish hand involved in crafting the speech but it was a really interesting speech and a very good one I thought um, I don't think there is much of a constituency Joachim for federalism in Ireland um, I don't think it's ever really been thought about seriously in Ireland or taken seriously and it may be because we've had such a unitary political system and a highly centralized political model of governance through all of the years of the state, very little power for local government. For example, you're, everybody's more than familiar with all of this. Um, but no, I don't see any, anything other than, uh, certainly Irish elites seem to be um, very happy with the fit between Irish priorities and European priorities it does put some pressure on, uh, in my view, in the right kind of ways, uh, on environment policy, for example, where we've been a laggard for a very long time, and where without European pressure, we wouldn't even be in the position we are today. But again, that suits, I think, some politicians, because they're able to say, if we had the choice, we wouldn't do this, but we have to do this because Europe is compelling us and our obligations commit us to doing so. Um, it may be slightly different on uh, the issue of corporate tax, but again, I think we're in a more settled environment now going forward. The agreement in um, Coreeper yesterday on the 15% OECD um, corporate tax model, uh, it was being held up by Hungary and Poland because they're using it as a bargaining chip <coughs> excuse me, on rule of law issues, but that kind of settles the matter, I think. And so that, that tension that was there between Ireland and a subset of EU member states, a rather large and important subset, um, that's probably um, not going to feature as much, I would say, in the years to come. Um, but to the extent that uh, Irish people think at all very much about what they would like to get from the EU. Brexit, I think, has, for most ordinary people, really underlined things that we took for granted over a very long period of time. Um, the freedom of movement, very obviously. When we now process through European airports, we often see our UK counterparts stuck in these really long queues while we advance forward majestically and very speedily like other EU passport holders. So that has brought home, I think, to many people, all of the value attached to freedom of movement. And I'd hope that we're not as complacent about it now as we used to be. And because we live or we inhabit the UK media space, we can see all of these horror stories about what Brexit has actually delivered. All of the catastrophes for small and medium-sized businesses, for example, trying to sell their goods into European markets. Um, there is a real awareness of all of that. And I think it's that's part of the reinforced commitment to Europe that many people I think have made psychologically. Um, <clears throat> and the second area or point on Brexit is a, a larger one. It's that um, it actually revealed the extraordinary depths of interdependence that the single market in particular had brought forth over these 30 years so that many people, even in the commission, I think, were surprised when the British began to try and disentangle themselves from the EU, they were surprised that uh, with every move they tried to make, there was a legal complication of one kind or another. In other words, the economic and legal depths of reciprocity were so extraordinary that they had it taken for granted quality for them. Um, I, I think all of that um, has really kind of underlined to Irish people um, how much 
we have sort of invested in the European Union and what might be at stake in any future referendum. Um, I don't think we're ever again going to see the kind of moral hazard that we saw in evidence in 2008 in particular, when the, the Lisbon one referendum was held. Um, and, and, and it's in good part because Brexit has been this extraordinary lesson in you know, what can happen if you don't take Europe seriously and if it's not communicated seriously domestically. But all of that is a very long-winded way of saying, I think most people are kind of happy with the kind of settled relationship which we have with the European Union. I don't think there is any great ambition either at elite level or public level to go, you know, that much further with integration. And I don't honestly believe that that impulse towards federalism, as admirable as it is, is so deeply embedded in other member states either, actually. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, John. I think it's been tremendous. So I want to thank you very much for, for your keynote lecture. I want to thank you very much for taking all these questions giving such thoughtful and really deep answers to all of those questions. We, we really learned a lot, we really enjoyed it. And I think it's been really a, a highlight of, of our event. So thank you so much for this. Um, having thanked you, I want to give everyone an opportunity to, to have a little bit of lunch because we have to start sharply at one o'clock because we still have a big program in the afternoon. So I want to thank you, uh, everyone, for listening. You're welcome to stay um, on the Zoom and just maybe switch off your camera, switch off your microphone, and we'll be back in 15 minutes. It'll be a quick lunch, and we'll be looking forward to, to seeing you here at the next panel. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Christian. Much, thank you thank very you. much. I can't hear you, Sarah. You're muted. Thank you. Amazing how many times it still happens. So, anyway, welcome back, everyone. After this uh, very uh, quick lunch break, we are back for session A5 on teaching the European Union perspectives from across the European Union and beyond. So we will have three uh, interesting presentations, I'm sure, in this panel. Unfortunately, uh, Patricia um, Hosbika from Aston University uh, is not able to join us today, meaning we will have three uh, presentations. So um, our speakers uh, have, let's say, 15 to, to 20 minutes uh, or 18, let's say 18 minutes maximum for each presentation, if possible, so that we can keep a little bit of time um, for questions and uh, hopefully answers as well. So I will start by introducing our three speakers before giving the floor to um, the first speaker, uh, who will be Dr. Patrick uh, Beisman, who is an Associate Professor in Teaching and Learning European Studies and Associate Dean for Education at Maastricht University's Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences in the Netherlands. He is a member of the faculty's Department of Political Science and teach BA and MA courses in the field of European Studies. So since the 1st of September has been Associate Dean for Education at the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences. Prior to this, he was Program Director of the BA in European Studies, after which he coordinated two teaching staff professionalization programs. And his research interests include the European public sphere, media neuroscepticism and EU democracy, as well as issues related to teaching and learning in European studies, which he'll be talking about. And uh, we are also joined by uh, Dr. Martin um, Rosema from uh, the University of Twente, also in the Netherlands. So Martin is Assistant Professor of Political Science and he teaches several courses about political science, governance, democratic legitimacy, European politics and research methods in the bachelor and master's programs in public administration and European studies, as well as the pre-master program in psychology. 
In his research, he focuses on themes such as digital democracy, democratic innovations, and the use of modern technology to study emotions, political attitudes, and behavioral change. And uh, last but not least, uh, we are joined by Dr. Stephen Turek, uh, from uh, who is based in the United States at um, SUNY uh, Brockport. And I'm sorry, I didn't have time to staple my sheets, which is always a recipe for disaster, isn't it? So I have found uh, Dr. Turek's uh, biographical note now. So he's an associate professor and chair of the Political Science and International Studies Department at SUNY Brockport. His research interests include comparative politics, European integration, democratization in Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union. And he has received several awards, including a presidential teaching excellence and outstanding service to students in 2018. So the three speakers will uh, tell us more about uh, teaching the European Union uh, from with perspectives from across the European Union and uh, beyond, and uh, notably for some of them using the experience of being involved in the Eurosim uh, simulation. So we very much look forward to hearing more from them. And without further ado, um, Patrick, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Sarah, for inviting me and Christian also for um, inviting me to the panel. Sarah, for introducing me. Um, Christian used to work at Maastricht, but I don't think we've seen each other for a very long time. So it's really nice to uh, see you. Um, yeah, thank you for having me. Um, thank you for the introduction. Um, as Sarah just explained, uh, I'm currently a social dean for education at our faculty in arts and social sciences, uh, but previously was also a program director of our large Bachelor in European Studies, and I still teach in that program and also a master programs in European Studies. Um, and then my talk today, which is entitled Why and How Study the European Union, I will also reflect a little bit on my experience. Um, and I will start by answering um, the why question. So why study the European Union? I will then continue to discuss how we should study the European Union. And towards the end, I will conclude with some reflections on ongoing discussions uh, here in the Netherlands. Um, now, a small warning, uh, for some reason, the app didn't work uh, on my uh, MacBook, so I'm now in the online environment, which hopefully is more stable than the Teams online environment. Um, so fingers crossed, but please let me know if you can't hear me or can't see me anymore. So why study the European Union? Let's start with this question. Um, and I'm probably preaching for the converted here when I say that it's impossible to understand modern day Europe without gaining at least some basic understanding um, of the EU. EU is everywhere around us. Uh, we, of course, have the euro in our hands and can travel freely across most of Europe. Uh, but there's also war, uh, more. Take the war in Ukraine, for instance, um, or the challenges presented by the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, both very obvious examples of crises in which the EU has played a central role. Uh, and Ukraine, through supporting the country uh, including offer it, offering it the perspective of membership and in the COVID-19 pandemic uh, through policies to maintain free movement. Three years ago or nearly three years ago, there was actually uh, all of a sudden a fence at the end of my street and my street ends in Belgium. So that was really weird. But uh, thank God the EU managed to deal with this. And of course, very important, uh, the joint procurement of vaccines. Uh, but the EU also plays a role in our daily lives in less obvious ways. Um, when you and I walk into our local supermarket to buy food, to buy drinks, we don't usually consider how EU policies have helped at large the offer, um, but also have helped to ensure food safety. And when I step into the classroom, as I did earlier today, in fact, uh, I'm welcomed by a diverse group of international students who are able to study here in Maastricht, partly due to policies that are a result of European cooperation. And I too benefit from this. Uh, in January, I will be on my own Erasmus exchange for two weeks uh, at the University of Leeds. Um, and this whole idea of the Erasmus Plus program is obviously a very good example of how staff and students of universities at different levels of education nowadays 
can travel around Europe, gain experience, gain new insights uh, in issues that they're interested in. And this perhaps, all of this is perhaps even more important for smaller member states such as Ireland and the EU, uh, the Netherlands, uh, for whom the EU is vital uh, for our economic prosperity and increasingly also for our security. So I think to me, the first question, the why question um, is very straightforward. Why should we study the European Union? If only because, because it's important that we understand what is happening in Brussels and that we also train young people to gain an insight into engage with European affairs to even represent our countries. Now the second question then is how then should we engage with the study of the EU? And in my view, this requires three things, or at least three things. Uh, an interdisciplinary focus, active learning, and ideally also an international classroom. So starting with the need for an interdisciplinary focus, the aforementioned crisis, and many of the topics that I just mentioned, can never be fully understood from an economic, legal, political, or financial perspective alone. And in addition, in order to understand contemporary European developments, we also need to analyze historical developments and the different cultural backgrounds of European countries in and outside the EU. Such political science alone is not enough to solve the European puzzle, or as a famous philosopher of science Karl Popper once put it, and I quote here, we are not students of some subject matter, but students of problems. And problems may cut right across the borders of any subject matter or discipline, end of quote. The latter is also believed why I think that the best way to engage in learning about the EU is active learning. Uh, by this, I mean, pedagogies that aim to motivate students to engage in learning in a collaborative way and in a contextual setting, linking concepts and theories to real life examples. Uh, and what this entails is perhaps best explained by comparing it to more traditional ways of learning. These often revolve around lectures, seminars in which teaching staff take center stage as experts who represent um, the topic and who present information to students. And learning in such environments may be able to instill students with sufficient knowledge, to pass their exams at least, but their actual engagement with the topics discussed will often remain rather limited and they may not learn how to critically evaluate them. In contrast, um, active learning encourages students to take control of their learning process, highlighting how content is relevant to their personal and career goals. Examples of these are problem-based learning here in Maastricht University, but also, for instance, challenge-based learning uh, at Dublin City University. And through engaging with concepts and theories in such settings, in a more authentic context, students become more motivated to learn, and they will also benefit more from looking at these different issues. Uh, and they will also start to look forward more to course um, on the EU, which in particular is important when you are teaching students that may not necessarily have signed up for these courses voluntarily. Um, and it's therefore also no surprise that when you look at the forms of learning that are used in many European studies programs across Europe, you see that they use active forms of learning. And then finally, so in addition to interdisciplinary learning and active learning, I also believe that um, this context, this authentic context, also requires students to be confronted with ideas and views from peers from other countries in an international classroom. Um, the internationalization of higher education is generally seen as contributing to the acquisition of essential intercultural skills for students who aim to work in multinational organizations. And because of this, universities have also been branding themselves as international universities. Uh, in fact, my university here, Maastricht University, on its website calls itself the European University of uh, the Netherlands. Criticism on internationalization mainly concerns the assumed marketization of higher education. Um, and in my own research, um, you also see that there are things definitely to take into account. We've done some research into the international classroom. Actually, one project is still ongoing. Uh, and here we find that while a classroom can be insufficiently international, 
um, interaction between students can also get lost in translation when the classroom is too international. But, but these are challenges I think that universities can pay attention to, for instance, by carefully arranging the composition of the classroom, but obviously also by training staff and students um, to engage with people from uh, other countries and backgrounds. Now this topic, internationalization, actually also brings me to the final part of my short talk, uh, maybe some reflections on uh, related ongoing dis discussions in uh, the Netherlands. And as I mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, the need for engaging with the study of European integration should be obvious for countries such as the Netherlands, yet the political climate hasn't always been instrumental in stimulating this. Um, Dutch political engagement with the EU and debate about the EU has become increasingly critical, in particular since what was called Black Monday in 1991, when an ambitious Dutch blueprint for a federal union was uh, rejected. Uh, but also, obviously, the 2005 constitutional referendum in uh, the Netherlands, where the Dutch rejected the constitutional treaty. Um, and some have even called uh, the Netherlands a UK light since, uh, partly also because it stepped into the gap that occurred after Brexit to become one of the more Eurosceptic members of the EU. Uh, but we have a new Dutch government since the 10th of January this year, and the tune of that government has changed quite dramatically. The coalition agreement took on board many plans that the French and the Germans had launched earlier, but which the Dutch had previously actually been extremely reluctant towards. For instance, the need for strategic autonomy, uh, autonomy or um, for European taxes. At the same time, when it comes to higher education and the study of the EU, things appear to be less positive at the moment. Uh, first, like in many other countries, politicians are discussing which study programs are most beneficial and most productive. Uh, and programs in the humanities and social sciences are generally not on that list, even though I argued before that it is these type of programs and these type of broader perspectives that will actually help us to uh, fully understand uh, the EU. Secondly, while politicians want more engagement with uh, student learning, some of the ways in which they measure learning is reproducing some of the older ideas about teaching and learning. Uh, for instance, this concerns the minimum number of contact hours that we should uh, offer to students, which often actually is based on a very limited definition of what those hours might look like. Um, and then finally, uh, and this is the most prominent discussion at the moment, uh, and this uh, concerning um, internationalization of higher education, or as some politicians refer to it, the uncontrolled influx of international students to the Netherlands. Um, this is probably a discussion about costs, which comes back every so many years, even though all research shows that these students actually bring in a lot more money than that they cost. But there's also a discussion related to the quality of teaching and learning. Again, even though there's sufficient research that also shows that Dutch students benefit from learning with peers from across Europe and the world. And all these three points, we have seen that universities invest a lot of time into ensuring that the discussion becomes more nuanced. Um, and for instance, just last week, Maastricht University and also the University of Twente, I should add, um, have added to this discussion and have become some of the most vocal critics of ongoing political discussions about these topics. Um, but my point is, and here I want to also finish my talk, that what seems obvious to many people in European studies and probably to everyone in this uh, online room may not always be so towards policymakers and national capitals. So it is important that we keep on emphasizing not just why it is important to study the EU, but also that we make a case for how to study the EU. And in my view, that means studying the EU from an interdisciplinary perspective based on active learning and in international classrooms. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Patrick. Um, Martin, over to you. Yes, thank you. Then I will... Uh try to do some screen sharing. It's always um, wait and see if that's working. But at least now I see yeah, that's fine. my slides and I see some faces. So Sarah, you confirm that's the same for you? Yes, perfect. Okay, great. Um, 
Let me start by um, saying thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to speak here um, about student simulations in the context of EU decision making. Um, and also to congratulate you um, with the launch of the uh, EU Academy. I think it's a really exciting uh, endeavor. So really happy to, uh, well, in this uh, very um, modest way, uh, be, be, be part of the celebrations, but really well done. Um, my talk will be about uh, a project that I've been involved in uh, as a teacher at the University of Twente. And I think it's a nice follow up to uh, what Patrick was saying um, with the plea for interdisciplinary approach, active learning and an international classroom, uh, especially the elements of active learning and an international classroom are really central in the project Eurosim that also Steve Jurek uh, is part of and Patricia, who was originally um, on the schedule and um, Johan Eliasson, who's, who's in the audience, has been working on that as well. So that will be my main uh, focus. So, so what I want to talk about is first give uh, you a bit of a background on the history and nature of, of Eurosim, uh, organized by a consortium called uh, Tassius. And then the five lessons that, that I've drawn uh, when thinking about uh, these experiences. Um, and I'll say a bit more about it, but my five lessons are basically first, do it. I think they're, they're a good tool. Uh, the second lesson, to, to make it realistic. Um, but the third lesson is to, to deviate it from that. So lessons two and three might seem contradictory, but you've got to deviate from reality. Uh, my fourth lesson that I'll speak about is that it's helpful to prepare the students well. Uh, but also not too well, um, and finally to uh, well to leave them alone in a certain way. So so I'll go through these lessons, um, and then um, um, read some conclusions. Um, Connor, I see the question: Is there a website for your sim? Uh, yes, there is, but I think it's it's difficult sometimes to find because um, well, it's it's a name that's been used by several uh, companies and organizations. So I actually recently had a student who was applying for participating in Eurosim and, and sent me the link and information from another Eurosim. So I'll try to look it up after my presentation and put a link in the uh, in, in the chat and otherwise reach out to me and I can, uh, can provide that to you. Um, let me see. Um, a brief history. Um, basically, Eurosim is... Um, an event that started in the 1980s, late 1980s in, uh, in New York State. Um, Steve Jurek's um, Institute, Brockport, was really at the heart of the, of the launch of this. Uh, so it's basically an annual event uh, organized by a consortium with the formal name Transatlantic Consortium for European Union Studies and Simulations, TACIUS. Um, and they've organized a four-day simulation of the decision-making in the EU uh, with the key political institutions. So it started in 88 with university colleges uh, in, uh, in New York State area, and it was inspired by the Model United Nations, and she can probably correct me if there's anything wrong of, of what I'm saying, um, but it was inspired by that. But they felt like, let's do something else to teach our students how politics really work in, in practice, and not just American politics, but much more, more broadly. And they decided to focus on the EU instead, and soon realized it would be fun then to have some European students involved as well. So in 1990, um, there were uh, European students who, uh, who were joining as well. Um, and at some point, um, the University of Twente also joined, but it was much later when a friend of mine who was working in the US said, well, one of the Dutch institutions that were participating uh, quitted, so there's room for another one. Would, would you like to join? Uh, it's already 15 years ago, so, so since then I've been involved. And as I said, it's my favorite teaching program. Um, and to give you a bit more of an idea, um, these are the institutions that participated in uh, the last few years. Uh, I think there's some others who, who are now joining, but you can see on the left hand side a whole range of, of colleges uh, and universities and, and campuses uh, in the US, primarily in the New York State area or close by, with one exception, and in Europe, different universities in Belgium, Germany, the Netherlands, uh, Poland, and the UK. So, uh, so quite some diversity, and that's really one of the pluses of the, of the whole endeavor. Um, a bit more about the nature of it. I think the best way I can, can summarize it is by showing you two pictures. Um, this is one picture that combines images of the Council of Ministers, uh, the European Commission, the European Parliament, and the European Council, the four key political institutions. And the basic idea of Eurosim is that these four institutions will be simulated in four days, but instead of these real politicians playing these roles, so to speak, 
it will be students uh, in their shoes. So they're meeting in plenary meetings of the European Parliament, in committee meetings. Um, they have meetings with the Council of Ministers and with the European Council, all with their own agenda. The European Commission is there with its own proposal. So really the dynamics of that are being simulated by putting students for four days in those positions. Um, the site alternates the remember institutes and usually one is hosting. So either in the US and Europe. So the next one is in, in South Wales. So um, uh, Christian Carlo, this is very special this year for me and next year, not only because of the EU Academy, because also because it will be hosting Eurosim. And each year there's another theme. Um, so uh, you can see here an overview of the places we've been to in the last, what is it, 12 years. And on the right hand side, a whole list of topics, the budget, migration, data protection, cybersecurity, energy, the EU budget, human rights, and the next topic for us is the, the EU Green Deal, where we will be focusing on the, the social climate fund and the commission proposal for a regulation on that topic. Um, typically about 150 students for about 20 universities and colleges in the US and Europe participate. And as I said, each student has one role, has one alter ego. So that could be the uh, environment minister from Slovenia, in, in my case, for the next uh, edition, or it could be a member of the European Parliament of one of the political groups. Um, but also members of the European Commission, uh, lobbyists, journalists, they all are there. And the students prepare for this at their own institutions. Uh, sometimes, like in Twente, we have a course embedded in a larger module about governance where students can, can sign up and participate with a maximum number. Uh, and sometimes I think in, in the US that's, that's happening a bit more often than in Europe. Students have their own student club and it's not really part of the formal curriculum but they have a student club where they participate as well. There will always be a lecturer involved in um, joining them to the simulation, but I think they're, they're a bit more on their own. So the preparation differs, but all have some way of, of preparation at the home institution. So that's the, the, the essence basically of, of how, this, uh, how this works. Um, how do we do it in my university? Um, I think it has shifted a bit across the years which also has got to do with how much time we've got. In the past, I had a separate course of five uh, course credits. So that gave me a bit more room to have class meetings and tasks than in the current setup. But nowadays we have uh, three days where we have, a, uh, five days where we have a three hour class meeting and we do skills exercises. So presenting and debating and negotiations. Um, we focus on the EU institutions and the theme of the simulation. So the European Green Deal or the Social Climate Fund for the upcoming one where students do presentations and we do a quiz on the simulation theme. And sometimes I have one of my colleagues to, to give a short lecture on the theme as well. And we end with a classroom session where we do a simulation of the simulation. Um, in our case, this is only with the students from Twente, so a group of, let's say, 12 to 15 typically. Some universities team up with two or three colleges, for instance, and, and, and do it uh, a bit at a larger scale than we do uh, at Twente, but at least we give them a bit of a feel for what they are uh, about to experience later on. Uh, in our case, I also ask them to write three papers, uh, two as, as a group paper. They are uh, a country or their particular political group, for instance, the left or Renew Europe, and they've got to write a position paper indicating what their position is, and they've right to write a strategy paper, what their ideas are about how to get what they really want. So what coalitions they want to pursue, uh, the role of informal meetings, uh, whatever comes to their mind. Um, and at the very end, after the simulation, they have to write a short reflection paper to, to share their thoughts about what they've actually learned on whatever they think comes to mind. They get some suggestions about things to guffer, but they can put in there whatever they like in terms of what they consider to be part of the learning experience. When thinking about all of this, I can think about what's actually the benefits of it and how can you really organize it well? And there are five things that I think for me stand out. And I'm, I'm pretending that some people in the audience might actually thinking, well, is this something for me to do in the future um, or not? And I think, the five lessons that I've got, the first one is, I would say, just do it. I know it's a phrase that is, uh, well, made popular by Nike, um, but I'm borrowing it here as well. Um, if there's one thing uh, I've, I've, I've noticed, it's that students learn so much from this. Uh, I've included here two pictures that to me resemble that. Um, at the bottom on the left, you see a brief summary of the co-decision procedure. Um, basically the, the heart of the legislative process. Uh, and I think students can, can look in the textbook how that works, 
But if they really experience it uh, by being in those positions, they start to really grasp it. Uh, and I think if there's one thing that my students learned that they oftentimes give me a feedback is that they said, I never realized how difficult it is to reach an agreement with, let's say, 25 countries or with seven different political groups in the European Parliament. Uh, there's no way to teach students that via a textbook telling them it's really difficult to reach agreements. But I think this is one of the things that they really notice if they're in that position for four days with all the frustrations that they've got. Um, they'll also learn a lot of things that are not, not in the textbook. To me, the, the image of the, the, the American and, and the European objects, I don't see containers, is that the proper American English word? I don't know. But uh, anyhow, um, I think this is what they notice as well. I wouldn't say it's a culture clash, but there are differences there. Um, I think one thing that I recall is that I, at, at some point I had one of my students who was a chair and she was doing a fantastic job, uh, but her English was just not that good. So at such a moment, she felt that one of the other participants had been speaking a bit too much. So she said, well, now you have to shut up. Uh, and that was considered to be a bit blunt. Um, but basically what she meant was, well, I would really appreciate if you would now give other participants a bit more room to speak or whatever way you want to put it. Uh, but to me, that symbolizes also that, that awareness of, 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 well, how your own background and those of other participants can have an impact and how you can also take that into account. Likewise, I think the American students um, sometimes have a language disadvantage in the sense that their English is so good that the European students are not able to follow them if they speak quickly. They've got to, to get used to that. So there's so many things in there that you learn in terms of skills as well as political procedures that I think is really worth it. It's also just fun. Students really enjoy it. And I think lecturers enjoy it as well by seeing them. Uh, but also, I think that certainly applies to Eurosim. Um, it almost feels like a kind of a family reunion every year where you see each other again. It's colleagues who are on the same page, who've got a passion for teaching, uh, who get along well. Um, and, and that also makes it fun. It's being together with colleagues in a different setting than research. And the first time that happened, I really had to get used to it. Being together with colleagues and not speaking about research, that felt like an alien world to me. Uh, but I started to appreciate it, that teaching is also a big part of what we do. It can be fun and can also be nice to, to be together with colleagues and, and focus on these things. And finally, a reason to do it is also that I think it doesn't require really special expertise. The main thing you need is just want to go for it. And of course, experience helps, um, but still, you don't need something special to be able to make that step. Perhaps that's the most important lesson, but I'll add a few others. The second one is, I think you've got to try to make it as realistic as possible, uh, because then students will learn most from it, and they will also really enjoy it more, because they really get a sense of how it works in practice. And there are dozens of ways in which you can make it realistic. What we in, in, in the Eurosim always try to do is starting with coming up with a theme that's realistic, something that's really on the agenda um, of the European Union. So that, that's the first thing that Try to create roles that are really realistic. I mean, these are people that exist. These are real ministers, real heads of government, real MEPs, real chairs of the presidents of the parliament or the European Council. That makes it realistic as well. What I also really like in, in Eurosim is that the documents look so real. We're just using the real EU, the real European Union documents and just modify them. But that adds to the experience of, of well, of how these type of things are being done. It's, it's, it's nicer than just having a Word document. Uh, the procedures have to be as realistic as possible as well, but you also have got to make sure that it's realistic in terms of informal meetings. It can be very tempting to just create a formal schedule, but as we all know, a lot of the decision making is done in, in an informal context. So you've got to try to include that as well to make it realistic. And there are so many other things that I really like. I think students become a bit more formalistic with their language. They become more formally dressed. We never enforce it, but they just do it automatically, and most of them really appreciate it. Um, the seating order in the rooms. I think there are so many things that you can do to make it realistic and it makes a better and more fun experience. Um, but a third lesson, there's a limit to it. First of all, we have less time. We're not going to simulate the decision-making processes in real time uh, because, well, that will take perhaps more time than our students need for just doing the whole degree program. So that's, of course, requires adjustments. Uh, Typically, you have fewer students in a simulation that people working on this in real time. So that's another reason why you've got to make adjustments. And finally, um, you also want all alter egos, all students to have a good learning experience. That also will require to make some adjustments. So what you can do is change the time schedule, for instance. 
do, do it in a few days, run things parallel that in reality do not. So in Eurosim, we have the European Parliament and the Council at the same time discussing the European Commission proposal instead of one waiting for the other. Um, so that's one, one example. You've got to somehow simplify the procedures. So in reality, we have a first reading and a second reading uh, of the Commission proposal. In Eurosim, we just merge them into one reading where the European Parliament and the Council work on it. And then afterwards, we have the trialogues. We're neglecting national parliaments. So these are ways to simplify reality. Um, we allocate time slots for informal meetings. That's not really how it goes in reality, right? Now you're going to have an informal meeting. It's a bit contradictory, but it works. And there are many other things. I think the members of parliament wearing name tags, you wouldn't see that in reality. We have people observing in the European Council. That's not very realistic. So, but I think my key message is keep it as realistic as possible. Deviate where it's necessary to make it a good learning experience. And you'll along the road learn what these type of things are. And I've given some examples. The fourth lesson, students need to come prepared to make it a good learning experience. Um, it makes it more realistic and you just get the better discussions and you, you can really focus on the content and the procedures. And it will also give students more confidence. I've never experienced a Eurosim where my students were not nervous. They're always nervous at the start. They don't know what to expect. And I think that's fine. But it will give them at least a bit more confidence if, if they are prepared. And that helps. That makes the difference between sitting and waiting and really participating. Um, and it prevents that you're annoying for the other participants. Because I think there's few things that are as annoying as someone who really has got no clue what he or he's talking about and then uh, participating. So, But at the same time, I would say don't do it too well. Because if you have one group of students who know everything in detail, the content, the procedure, et cetera, and you've got some others who are a bit lower level, you don't have a level playing field. So you want them to be roughly on the same page to a certain extent. Um, and of course, your time is limited, right? There's a limit to what we can do. So, so what helps in my experience is really to get the students together now and then in class meetings, we're doing discussions or exercises. Let them do preparatory tasks like writing a position paper in particular. That's something that students always report to me that they find really useful and inform them about what to expect. Um, but don't have the ambition that you can take away all the nerves because I think it's just part of it. The final thing, and I've, my hunch is that this is where some of my colleagues and I might deviate most strongly, but I really like to, as I call it, leave them alone. Uh, here it says, keep calm and leave them kids alone. I don't like speaking about students as kids. But I know that that's that some of my, my colleagues, is, that's the language they use. And uh, I think it makes it more realistic and makes it a better experience. I think they've got to be at their own at some point. And I think they'll learn more from it if they really have to make all the decisions themselves. Uh, and in my case, students oftentimes also told me afterwards that they appreciate it. Beforehand, they didn't really like it. And afterwards, they said, oh, it's actually quite cool that we really had to do everything on our own. So I'm never giving students instructions beforehand in terms of what to do. Uh, or during this, oh, you should do this or you should do that. Uh, but I try to be there in terms of supporting them in their decisions, unless they're violating the law or the rules of the game. But I say, I'll be behind you. Uh, and if you need, if you want feedback or advice, I mean, come up to me. But very few do. Um, so, so that's what I really like. So if I put all of that together, I would say, well, what are the conclusions that I've been drawing from this experience? I think simulations are really uh, an excellent tool to teach students how the, how the EU works. I think it's a really good addition to, to the textbook stuff and the lectures that we typically do. And they're really fun for both students and lecturers. Uh, and of course, it depends a bit on, on who's there and how you organize it. But there's nothing that gives me that much pleasure in terms of teaching experience and being with colleagues than, than these type of games. Um, and there's a lot of experience out there that you can use. I think uh, Stephen, uh, Christian, um, um, Johan in, in the audience, uh, people are, I think, willing to share. There's also some colleagues of mine who've written about it, so feel free to, to, to use that. Um, my final note, this is just my view, so feel free to ignore everything, of course, uh, but at least I've, I've, I've shared my experience, and if there's anything that's been used to anyone, great, and if not, I'm just going to say a big thank you for, uh, for paying attention. I'm looking forward to, uh, to what Steve has to do uh, to share about uh, the American perspective and also having gone uh, through all of this. So uh, thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Martin. Certainly a very excellent summary of, of your experience and uh, 
and a strong encouragement indeed to, to try to use simulations. And I, I agree with you that uh, indeed it's a kind of experience that students tend to remember. Sometimes you meet students many years later and they still remember that they were Spain or France. So it's really interesting to see. So uh, I will now hand over to uh, Steve, who will provide uh, an American perspective, because I guess um, in general, there's a perception in, in Europe that perhaps the Europe and the European Union are less important uh, to America than uh, we used to be. Um, so is it also uh, an impression that you have, or is there still a strong interest uh, in the European Union amongst your students? Okay, hi. So hopefully I'm doing this right as well. Um, I'm showing you my Teaching American Students European Integration. Is that correct? Uh, if you could just click on the presentation mode at the bottom, uh, on the right of the on the right of the little book. Otherwise, I think we won't. We if you could put it on full screen, uh, yeah. Steve, that would be helpful just because now right. we see that's perfect. Yes, okay. perfect. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So, OK, a couple of things. Uh, I'm going to talk just a little bit about <clears throat> the perspective of teaching European integration and the politics of the EU from the American perspective and what it means for our students. Um, and then I want to talk a little bit also about Eurosim as well. And thanks so much, Martin, for, for all that information and um, really, really helpful. And, and maybe some of the people listening to this might have more interest in it. Um, I did post in the chat. Uh, let's see. I will click on that now. So that's a specific one to Brockport if people are interested to in checking that out. A lot of the schools have their own, uh, but we'll we'll talk about that in a sec. Um, so first for clarification, obviously there's a geographic component to this. So um, not just being American students far away from the European Union and it not necessarily as relevant uh, in their daily lives, um, but it's also important to note that uh, we're in Western New York. So for those of you that are not familiar, uh, we're nowhere near New York City. Um, lots of times people think that because we're uh, State University of New York that somehow we're near there. We're 556 kilometers away from New York. So we're a five, six hour drive. That's about the same thing as Cardiff to Brussels. Um, and I'd also I want to note too that many of my students in particular, uh, so we're kind of between Rochester and Buffalo, if you're familiar with the geography, uh, but it's also very rural. And so I actually have a lot of students who've never been on a plane before or have not traveled outside of pretty much their comfort zone, which is oftentimes very much a rural part of New York State. Um, so just to kind of put that in, in the back of your mind. So this, this is why there's a lot of challenges with teaching uh, the EU for our students uh, in particular. And I think uh, uh, Johan and others uh, have seen this as well um, with our students. So what is my approach? Well, <clears throat> I do have a full class uh, that we teach every year in the fall. It's a full semester class, three credits, and it's just run like a regular Kind of class, so to speak. So I use a textbook. I use, you know, uh, whatever news I can every day. I try to make sure that the students present. I try to make sure that the textbook is up to speed. Um, I, you know, occasionally when there hasn't been an edition that's that's the most latest, I find that that creates a lot of confusion for our students. Uh, you know, the the EU is changing, right? It's it, it's it's enlarging, and then obviously with Brexit, it slightly contracted. I also found out that the jargon uh, needs to be used a lot. Um, the, the words that are used to describe integration, sovereignty, supranationalism, intergovernmentalism, all these other kinds of things, not to mention all the institutions, that can be very confusing for our students. So I try to make sure that whatever book I use, whatever materials I use, has a, a heavy dose of these key words that are also in the uh, glossary in the back so the students can look them up. I mean, I know this might sound a little bit elementary, but these are all foreign concepts for our students. They don't, they don't understand it in that perspective, right? They're only used to presidentialism. They're only used to uh, a federal union and a presidential system. So when we're talking about all of these other things going on with Europe and 27 countries, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a lot of uh, you know, sticker shock, so to speak, right? Because they, they see it and they're like, I, I don't understand this. So uh, that, that is a big a concern of mine when I'm teaching just the politics of the EU or anything about the European Union. And I also like to make sure that there's frequent comparisons back and forth with the US. Um, I, I find, and this book in particular is one that I like by Jonathan Olson, because it does that. It'll come back to and talk about, you know, maternity leave, for example, 
uh, or lack thereof in the United States, where it's only in certain places that it is. You know, in private companies, there is no guarantee that your job is there after your uh, leave of absence, right? Uh, and those are the kinds of things that students can relate to. So I know that's kind of on a uh, the, the periphery of this, but it, it's important in, in that context for our students to see that there's a whole bunch of other ways that other countries around the world do things, not just healthcare, but in social policy, environmental policy, and lots of other ways to do it. So my class itself is kind of just structured along that way, and I, I do the best I can to overcome the many, many challenges that we have. Uh, and one of them that probably stands out the most, uh, or that comes to my mind right away, is that you know, some of my students who are a little bit, you know, more, um, have more capabilities, have the ability to understand more things, have have studied more, have taken history classes, have done their world civ classes, etc. Uh, they can have a higher baseline, but there's, it's very, it, the, the parameters are so wide. Um, I can't tell you what the range is. I've got some students that, you know, at times can struggle with finding the most recognizable boot on the planet uh, in Italy. And that sometimes is a little embarrassing, but I try to get them along quickly because I try, I try to get that range to, to truncate as fast as I can. Um, for all of you, I don't, I, I'm sure even you in <laughs> European Union and teaching European Union, the number of acronyms and the number of the way the EU labels its things can be very, very confusing. And there's your students become, especially, and I, I, I can say this with great confidence, American students are very overwhelmed by the number of acronyms and the number of labels for every single thing that comes down the line. And all of you, I'm sure, are running through your head right now, the 5,000 ones that you can think of right now off the top of your head. Uh, and here's another one that always throws my students for a loop. And I, I, I know I just, this is one thing, if ever I had the ear of someone in the European Union, please stop using this, the council, um, the, the, the students, and, and even us faculty, when we're writing about it back and forth, and sometimes someone refer to the council, we're talking about the council of ministers, but sometimes some of our uh, colleagues even might mistake that for the European council. And that does happen uh, because it's thrown around all the time. And then obviously the last one has nothing to do with the European Union in a way, right? The Council of Europe. But when students see this, when they're looking up things online, uh, this can be a problem because they see this and they're not sure what are we talking about. Uh, and so that that's always a little bit frustrating. And I wish they would come up with a different name for it, uh, but that's just my two cents. The other thing that's obviously a, a huge challenge for American students, and even though they are familiar with federalism in the United States, and it, obviously there's the uh, state level and the federal level, so they do understand that Europe is far more complex. Uh, the, the way the interaction between um, the member states and the European Union, but also within the European Union, right? You've got the interinstitutional, uh, uh, you know, relationships that are going on. And as Martin showed before with this picture, the, the major co-decision process for legislation, um, th there's so much going on in there, not to mention the fact that not every member of the European Union is at the same kind of layer, right? You've got the differences between the countries. And so that's something that um, I, I really try to do the best I can. And I use diagrams and as much as I can, these Euler diagrams to try to show students what they are. And this adds a tremendous amount of complexity. You can't do this with the United States. It fits in, right, squarely as one state, right, on the national stage, right? You don't have opt-outs from Nebraska, right? There, there might be differences within their uh, statewide electoral politics, but, you know, Idaho doesn't opt out. And, and you've got all of these different overlapping relationships that can make it very, very difficult uh, for students. And, and, you know, all of us are, are very familiar with this, but, you know, even this, uh, you know, diagram doesn't show who uses the euro. If you did that, then you're going to make a, a, you know, a complicated one right in the middle there somewhere, right? And you're going to eliminate a few countries and you're going to add more. Croatia is going to join right in January. So they'll be using the eurozone, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but so these kinds of things um, at first glance for students can be very overwhelming because there are a lot of relationships going on and different organizations that countries are in. And I saw before that um, Ian Cooper was on. I also use this one as well. So then when we get into the nuts and bolts of the European Union, which countries cooperate more with each other? I also use this for preparation for my students for uh, Eurosim as well. 
Uh, but this is another way for students to sometimes be overwhelmed, but also for them to kind of understand, oh, wait a second. Uh, yeah, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania do actually have a lot in common. And the Baltic sister states do actually meet more frequently and have kind of a, a more united front when they're dealing with the rest of the European Union. Uh, but then there's also bigger relationships and they also deal with the Nordic. And I saw before um, um, in, the, in the previous discussion, he was talking about the Hanseatic League with Ireland. Uh, that, that's really important. You can put a diagram to it and say, oh yeah, okay, that's when Ireland is cooperating with the rest of these countries. And so it can be very helpful. And this is one of the ways that I do it to try to overcome some of these challenges of our students being, um, I think, uh, just being bombarded with so much information. And so I start slow and then we slowly move into uh, more and more of these complex things. The challenges uh, continue, and I think all of us have probably noticed this at one time or another too, right? Transatlantically, ideologies do not have this um, consistent definition across the water. It just, they don't, right? Liberal means different things. Um, you have conservative meaning something differently, and we can get into lots of different examples of this. Um, and that's mostly due to you know, the Western hemisphere really only having the two party system being represented. Um, while there is variance within the two parties, uh, no question about it, but students, at least from the American perspective, they're only presented with these two and they don't understand all of the different nuances between them. They also can't understand that there actually is a left, okay, and a right. Um, they can't understand as much. It just takes longer that there are centrist, there's multiple centrist parties. Right. And, you know, what's this renew Europe thing that, that their heads start to explode? Wait a second. There could be a party kind of in the middle. Right. So this these kinds of things um, are again, it's it's kind of sticker shock. Wow. You can have multiple parties that represent across the political spectrum, whereas they were just used to mostly moderate right, mostly moderate left, even though the parties in the U.S. get pulled by their extremes. Um, for the most part, though, that's been relatively consistent, at least in their lifetimes. Right. And so. <clears throat> You add on to this the, and I mentioned this just before, but parliamentary systems in and of itself, those need full blown discussion, right? So I have to explain to students what that means. What does coalition government means? What happens if you don't win an outright majority? And you have to deal with maybe not just one junior partner, partner, maybe two, sometimes three. What happens when it's two of the big parties that have to do a grand coalition, right? These things are very complex for, for our students in understanding European politics, but then also what happens at the EU level when you have different systems with a staggered election cycle. Um, what that means for the configurations of, for example, our wonderful Council of Ministers, because the ministers can change. If the governments come and go, you can have ministers change. And so actually, um, you know, our alter ego list that we will be using in the upcoming Eurosim, that could change because we know governments can collapse, new governments can form, and a student can who who has a you know this particular alter ego, it might might be changed by uh, as soon as a couple of weeks, and that does happen. Uh, not to mention also the fact that you can have multi-member districts, which that also can cause a lot of challenges for our students understanding European politics in general, um, and and I think that. Um, we can do a good job of explaining it, but they, again, they don't see how it all fits together until we bring it all at the kind of the EU level. Uh, and the last challenge that I want to say, because the EU has lots of things uh, in, in parties that are associated with social democracy or even socialist parties, uh, that word itself has such a pejorative uh, connotation in the United States that it kind of throws them for a loop. They're just, they don't understand what that means and where this is, where this falls on the uh, ideological spectrum um, when we're talking about uh, using democratic means to achieve greater equality as opposed to revolutionary Marxism, uh, which is what they're typically kind of brought up to, to, to lead it to believe. So those are a lot of the different challenges that we have. And again, this is kind of jumbling a little bit of uh, European politics in general from member states, but with the EU, but they it matters because all of these things are represented at the EU level in some way. There are, there are things that make sense. So one of the things that I think I'll, I'll kind of end with my section, and then I'll comment about uh, Eurosim at the bottom here, is that I try to do my best, obviously, to use lots of diagrams, but if you're not familiar, I'm sure most of you are, EU Confidential Podcast is absolutely wonderful. I found that 
this really helps the students. They need to hear about how the, the, the reporting and the interview, they're talking about Ursula von der Leyen. They're talking about Charles Michel. They're, they're, they're quoting him and they're, they're, or her, and they're, they're specifically interpreting it for how, it, what does it mean for the EU in general? They talk about war in Ukraine, and then they say, well, what does the EU think about it? How does this matter? And they interview different people, as most of you are familiar with, and I think it's really helpful. And I've actually incorporated that uh, into my my tests, actually, I say, according to such and such uh, EU confidential podcast, what does the EU think about this or et cetera, et cetera. So I do lots of things like that. I also try to overcome our very, very uh, profound geography gap uh, with geography quizzes. I know, again, that sounds elementary, but for American students, it's really helpful. And so I found that this, this works. And uh, and, and as all of us, hopefully, as, as instructors, we're always evaluating ourselves, and I try to make sure that I'm using the concepts consistently, uh, and I make sure that we define them, and we frequently use them, and I actually specifically prompt them. You, you need to use these words when you're describing something, or, or if you're going to do an essay question. Here's a list of 20 words that you should be including in it. I think that's extremely important uh, for for them to be familiar with all of these different uh, terms and the jargon that's used in the European Union. And as Patrick mentioned before, and, and Martin certainly, um, uh, you know, articulated, you know, how to engage the EU, certainly the interdisciplinary focus, active learning, and, and this international setting. So this is how I progress through it. So the first thing that I do is we do a micro simulation. So I just do it with my students, as Martin said he did. I just do mine, and we'll just do something very um, basic. So we'll just practice qualified majority voting. And it'll just be about uh, putting ingredients on a pizza or something like that. And the students absolutely love it because they don't understand it. You can show them the website. You can show them how it works. But they don't understand, again, how difficult it is for 27 member countries to, to agree on something political. We have a hard time agreeing on you know, what we want on our pizza. So that, that kind of like real world but simple kind of um, um, exercises, I think, really helps. And then as we move through the semester, we do ask other local area schools, and we've had uh, several that are also members of, of uh, TACES to, to come, but um, we would do it with some of our area schools, and we would actually assign uh, alter ego roles, and we would simulate at least one or two of the institutions. We try to do the European Council, and then we'd also uh, try to do Parliament in some way. It depends on how many students we get. Uh, sometimes we've had up to 20 to 30 students participate, and it's really fun. Uh, the, the students start to understand what it means to argue a political ideology in parliament as opposed to uh, uh, re representing a member state, right? And, and, and I think that that's really important. And, and, and these things are all for them to prep and prepare for our international simulation that we're fortunate enough to be going to um, Cardiff in a couple of weeks to actually have our Eurosim uh, function. So, these things uh, build, are the building blocks, and these are what help to prepare my students. Um, I've been uh, a part of Eurosim since 2009, and I've borrowed heavily from Martin from Twenta and from uh, Peter Bursons from the University of Antwerp on how to prepare my students. So I actually do things very, very similar. Um, you know, imitation is the greatest form of flattery, right, Martin? So I, I, I absolutely do that. I have them write position papers. I have them write their strategy papers beforehand. And then uh, I also have them write reflection papers afterwards. Um, and that's also a way to help upper administration understand the, the value and the impact of these uh, this four-day uh, uh, international experience. Because when administrators see that, it, it's, it's a better way to kind of get a uh, favorable uh, funding if you can get it. But one, a couple of things I just wanted to add on because uh, the value of Eurosim is, is I, I, we think it's, it's wonderful. And I couldn't agree with Martin's five uh, concepts uh, better. But one thing I will say too is that it really is interdisciplinary because there's a psychological component to it. There's a sociological component to it. There's the, and, and Martin touched on some of these, but the intercultural competency, this is where this comes into play. Um, but there's also basically, you know, public speaking um, and, and a practicum for a skill set that oftentimes students don't get at university. So this is them engaging with others and demonstrating, hopefully, their ability to orally communicate 
but body language is important and they see how this matters when you conduct yourself in a meeting. And I, a lot of us probably take this for granted. Well, for students, this is this is a really important thing. And, and, and COVID shut everything down, right? For so long, students have been very awkward socially, I think for a little while. And this I think is really important. I can't wait to get back to this where students see how are you going to bargain? How are you gonna negotiate? How are you gonna compromise? How are you going to horse trade, right? That's the essence of politics. What can, what do I have to give up for, for so that you will uh, join me in my position so that we can get what we want passed? Um, so I think that that's really important that all of those practical skills come into play, not just the politics of it, not just the ideology, uh, because that's obviously very important too, but there's so many other things that go along with this. And I also wanted to add too that it's not just alter ego roles that are members of any of the institutions. We also have lobbyist roles and we have journalist roles. Uh, so even if you have students that are not necessarily interested in politics per se or how the EU functions, they can play a role of a journalist uh, and it can be really fun and exciting. The, the students, I always tell them to follow these, their alter egos on social media, um, but also reach out to them and actually email them. So the last time we were in person when we were at the University of Antwerp, one of my students was playing a reporter from RT and she emailed him and he met her in Antwerp. Uh, and she got to sit down and talk to him about how he would represent his role and basically how she could be an agitator because she was representing RT. And so she was deliberately misquoting some of the students who didn't like that, but it was absolutely a part of the organic way that uh, the, the simulation plays out. And so that's really fun. And so. Um, I think the values of that are just absolutely wonderful, and the experiences that we've had um, over the years have been great. And I, and I, and I think that um, you know going forward, we we um, are going to continue to expand on this. And I think kind of institutionalizing our our website is better. I, I did put that in the chat, so I don't know, um, we, but that's it is tough because we are um, like Martin said, it's more or less a kind of an informal consortium of faculty who get along and are willing to put in the legwork to make this happen. And, and, and that's kind of why we maybe haven't been as institutionalized as maybe we want to be, but that's something we can always work on. So that's kind of what I have to say about this. We, we have a lot of challenges to teaching our students, but I think we can overcome them. And when you actually let the students be involved in this big uh, international simulation that lasts for four days, uh, they come back just changed people. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's just so transformational to them. Um, and, and certainly them getting out of their comfort zone is extremely important. The value on that uh, is immeasurable. And so I'm looking forward to it uh, coming up again. So that's my chat and uh, I will stop share and let Sarah and Kristen take over. Thank you very much, Steve. So for all of you out there who are not part of the simulation yet, what have you been doing is, is the question. So <laughs> I think after those wonderful presentations, you, you will get new partners um, who will join the, um, uh, Eurosim uh, in the future. Um, that was really extremely interesting. So thank you very much to all of you. So there was a question in the chat uh, I saw earlier from Edwin about um, actually uh, EU studies and whether we should still teach about the EU in the UK, not that the UK has, has left the European Union. So the question was considering that the UK has exited the EU, how important is it to still teach UK students about the EU? institutions and simulations well i guess adrian um i don't know if other colleagues want to to join uh, in answering that perhaps uh christian for for the specific uk perspective but i guess um it's a question around i guess that the simulation enables students to develop a lot of skills in in so many ways and so i guess it's if it's useful to us students i uh, i would uh, certainly imagine that it would still be useful to UK students as well, but uh, Christian, would you like perhaps to comment on that one? Is it specifically about the UK? Yes, well, I, I, I certainly, I, I remember I provided a letter also to Steve and, and to a few others how important it is to, to do those simulations. So I think certainly, as you say, uh, those kind of skills that you acquire 
uh, uh, irrespective of whether, in a sense, the UK is a member of the European Union or not, and those kind of networks and cultural skills and social skills and entrepreneurial skills and everything else that the students are learning. And my experience has been that, you know, UK students are enjoying that experience as much as anybody else. So I, I think that um, they're certainly not not behind in terms of in enjoying it. So I certainly think that's a that's a great experience um, for, for UK students and, and also for others. I, I, I hope that maybe in the future we'll also get other countries on board at some point, uh, you know, maybe more peripheral countries that are not part of the European Union or, or whatever, you know, I think that can only add to the to, to, to the interesting mix. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know if there are other questions. I shall abuse my power as a chair to ask one then. Um, so during the pandemic, I think that your team went online. So I was wondering whether you could share with us some reflections on, you know, how did it work or perhaps didn't work so well? I guess you're back in person. So is there, um, you know, what did you learn from, from trying to run a simulation online? Um, I'll, I'll start a little bit and then Martin, you can certainly chime in and even Johan, who also was at these. So uh, it was supposed to be hosted at the University of Niagara uh, or Niagara University rather. And that's also in Western New York, right near Niagara Falls. And that's when we went online. Um, so the program was actually pretty interesting. It, it was a software program called Verbella and it was basically a simulation, but you were all created your avatars and then you would physically walk around this uh, virtual world and then they would put you in the different rooms and so we actually it it we did pretty good i think it was it was pretty interesting how we could simulate an awful lot of actually doing things in person um it's it's still not the same thing um there's always some issues with students logging in and that kind of thing like the technical stuff but for the most part it actually went fairly well uh and i and i can say i mean this the this the the software that was used was pretty it was pretty sophisticated. Um, you could go to the beach <laughs> and you could play soccer or football rather. Uh, you could play football on the pitch and they, they had all kinds of different activities. Um, there was also a moment that was um, kind of existential for me. I, I'm walking around with my avatar during in this, this, this virtual campus and you could walk up to and look at the artwork on the walls while the host, uh, Chris Lee, posted a picture, a real picture of me, Martin, and a couple of other people from Antwerp in 2000 and was it 10 or something like that, or 2016 on the wall. So I'm looking at my computer screen, watching my avatar look at a real picture of me and other colleagues from here at a simulation. So it was pretty weird, but it, it but actually it, it worked out pretty good. Um, and then last year we had to do it again, uh, Trier, hosted it so to speak virtually we scaled it back it was much less expensive we kind of went back to like just kind of stick kind of like figures blocking around um the connections weren't as strong but it still worked and we got through it and thankfully uh we we did and we were able to you know christian taking the reins then and still we kind of bumped him a little bit because we wanted to have it in person and he was willing to do that so uh, thank thank you both really for for letting us kind of come now and and we're excited to have it come back so we're really happy that we were able to kind of bridge the gap and not stall because if we would have stopped it i think it would have been really hard to get the schools back together um the officers of tasius were able to kind of just keep things going um as best we could and i'm, I'm fortunate that we we did and so um, you know so that was good. Thanks. Yeah, I, I can add a few things. Um, I think, um, let me start by saying I was quite skeptical about doing it online. Um, uh, and, and myself from Twente side, uh, the first uh, online edition we, did, we didn't, didn't join, but but last year we did. Um, I think what makes a difference is you can, if you do it online, you can do it in two ways. One is that you would say, well, just like the ministers are sitting behind their computer and you can see their face on the video call, you can do video calls with students sitting at home. Uh, that's one way to do it online. Uh, the other way to do it, and this is how we approach it in Eurosim, like Steve uh, explained, will work with avatars. Um, and we had two different environments. I think the, the Fabella one that you mentioned, I think I only had a look at some of the videos. I think it looked more realistic and looked a bit more appealing to me. 
The other one we used uh, last year was Get a Town. I think I've been using that in, in conference setting as well. Um, but I've changed from, from being quite skeptical towards being quite enthusiastic about it. And I think the students are um, very good in just moving the whole thing towards this avatar online environment and experiencing it. I think it's no substitute from doing it in a physical edition. Um, so in that sense, I think if you have the option to do it in a physical way, I think it's realistic, it's nice, and it adds a lot to it. It also really adds a bit more of a social component. That's also something the students really value, that if they hang out in the evening in the bar with each other, they're also talking about European policy or and, and changing views. And these type of things, you get less in the online environment, but I still was afterwards much more positive than I was beforehand. I think it's still a really good learning experience. And it might also be a way in which you can incorporate students who are not able to join otherwise. Uh, you can do this with people from all over the world or from countries where the universities don't have the money to let the students travel to the UK or Belgium or the US or whatever. So I think it opens up new possibilities and I've become quite positive. Uh, but as I said, only as an addition too, because I don't think it's just like with academic conferences. I'm happy we can do things online like this, but I'm and I see the value of it. But I wouldn't say we can move online and do everything online. So I'm still happy that we have the other things as well. But as I said, much much better experience than I was initially expecting. Thank you. And there's a question from Paul. Uh, it's not so much a question as just to say uh, thanks to Steve for the presentation. It made me realize really how much we take for granted or how much I take for granted of what I'm, I've absorbed about the EU and how strange, how absolutely strange some of this must appear. But uh, I, 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 I hesitate to do this, but I have to add another challenge to him while I'm doing it. And it's one that uh, it, the Commission paid particular attention to, and that is the flying of the European flag. Uh, if you go back to your first slide on challenges, your European flag there is upside down. Never let the Commission see that. <laughs> You're in trouble. <laughs> Thanks. No, thanks for pointing that out. Um, <laughs> uh, but actually, I have a question for, for Martin. Maybe you can um, talk about this a little bit. So the, the simulation that we have, it's, it's really one of the only ones that has European and American students. And I was wondering if maybe you'd want to touch a little bit about, you know, the value of having Americans in the simulation. Obviously, I can talk about it, but I'd like to hear from your perspective. And even if Johan's listening, um, what, what that means of having American students in uh, the, the simulation. And Christian. Yeah, yeah, great question. Yeah, I, I don't see any value of that at all. No, I'm joking. Uh, I'm joking. As you, you know me well enough to know immediately that I'm joking. Um, it's also something where I changed my mind. I think before I joined my first Eurosim, I felt like, well, it's nice that we can go to the US and then combine it with a couple of days in New York uh, City. And students are much more willing to pay a bit money for that and, and add that to the experience. But I didn't beforehand realize how much of an added value it has in terms of the simulation itself and the chats they have. Um, for me, what, what symbolizes it is, is, is one chat I had with uh, one of the American students. I think it was one from Canisius College in my first Eurosim um, that, that we were hanging out after the first or second day and having a chat about what the EU was. And he was presenting me his view on the EU and why he thought it was a wonderful thing. Um, my not so fair but brief summary is he said, well, if you go closer to each other, you become more like the US. Isn't that fabulous? Uh, aren't we great? Uh, and, and I think he gave me a different way of looking at the EU. It's a bit like if you want to know your own country, the best way to learn your own country is go abroad because then you'll start noticing it. So I think they are able to, 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 to give us a different perspective on the things we know. And, and just like Paul said, like things we take for granted to show that. In that case, I also remember that with that students, I really had a really nice chat about what it means to be part of a larger group. And he said, well, isn't this just wonderful? And we had a chat about what it would be like if the US would team up with Canada and Mexico and that the Canadians and the Mexicans would 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 co-decide what was happening in the U.S. And he said, "You just made me change from a euro euro uh, whatever to a europhobic." Um, so I think for me that symbolizes the kind of chats you can have, and you can only have them with people who have a different perspective. Uh, and I think that's really valuable. And the other element is, it's also something that my students listed this time. I asked them like, "What other reasons you signed up?" Uh, and they mentioned all kinds of things, but they also really mentioned that they like this intercultural 
um, environments in terms of see how things work in other countries. In, and, and then, of course, the contrast between the Netherlands and the US is just larger than between the Netherlands and Germany um, or without. So I think it, it, in, in these two ways, uh, it, it contributes a lot. Um, yes. Thank you. Uh, so Patrick, you, you touched upon that kind of questions. You said that, um, you know, it was a bit of a sensitive topic, uh, the amount of international students in the Netherlands. So is it, a, you know, is it sensitive at the political level or is it also within universities or are actually staff and students very happy with having uh, such a large body of international students? Um, it's very much a political issue. So it's quite a big debate and uh, a lot of problems which perhaps come with international students are now made problems of international students, uh, for instance, the housing crisis. Um, it is an issue within some universities, in particular in relation to certain types of programs. So we get a lot of students um, studying uh, from outside of the Netherlands, studying at, in the psychology programs. And they actually want to lower the amount of international students. Uh, but depending on the university that you ask, um, the, the advantages and the interest in having international students is, is much higher for the uh, uh, universities in the border regions, which also includes Twente. We need international students. Um, um, so that's one thing, the type of programs that many of these universities have also benefit from this exchange. Um, and, and interestingly enough, at the same time that we have these discussions at the level of um, research universities, uh, universities of applied sciences uh, are actually calling for more international students very vocally because they want a more international uh, uh, audience and a more international student body. Um, but it, it's a discussion which has been coming back every so many years. And as I, as I said earlier, it's mostly been a discussion about how much it costs. And every time there's a new report and every report shows that it actually brings in money. But it's now become very much also a, a topic of quality about um, Dutch students which are supposedly pushed out of programs because of the influx of international students. Um, a discussion about international students not having the same level um, as Dutch students, and, and especially on this point, we see that this is not the case. Um, but it creates a very, it creates a tension because you're in a situation in which academia and the things that we discuss in academia are all international, you know, just like, like this, this session today. Uh, but politicians are phrasing some of this in a very nationalistic way. And, and the, the, the funny thing is that one of the most vocal critics from one of the liberal parties, she herself studied European studies. So uh, there's some really strange and weird things going on. Most students and most staff and most programs seem to be very positive about uh, working with international students, international colleagues and so on. Many thanks, uh, Patrick. And I see that Johan has, has his hand up. So we're almost out of time, but uh, Johan, you will have the, the last word or perhaps last question, I don't know. No, oh, okay. No, I just wanted to add, um, well, I, I've had to follow up my phone for various reasons, but add to what Stephen Martin said, and also what was just commented on is strange because I've just advised a few of my students to go study in the Netherlands. So, um, but the, you know, I think in addition to the value about learning about the EU, which is a an extremely foreign concept for, for Americans, and is the social interaction with Europeans. But because despite what we as academics may think about the similarities across the Atlantic and, you know, sort of the, the the nuanced differences that exist uh, to most of our American students, particularly the type of students that I have, that Steve have, um, and many other schools participating have, uh, this is a world of difference. Um, and the nuanced differences in how a Dutch or a Polish or an Italian student approaches things or thinks about things that they that they start discussing when they interact over lunch or 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 side discussions is just as valuable oftentimes as learning about the EU proper, um, because those are the things that help bridge the, the vast misperceptions that still do exist in the US about Europe, about the socialist, communist, you know, over-regulated, bureaucrat bureaucratic, uh, 
uh, you know, peace-minded Europeans that never want to do anything. And, and, and I, I mean, it sounds ludicrous, but that is very, very much um, the view of many rural Americans still today. And therefore, any type of interaction is beneficial, both academically and socially. Thank you very much. Uh, incredibly interesting to, to hear this, uh, these different perspectives. So uh, we have come to the end of this session on teaching European Union perspectives from across the EU and beyond. So please uh, join me in uh, virtually thanking uh, all our presenters. And uh, we have, um, it's been, I think, a really interesting uh, session. And uh, I'm sure that those involved in, in the Eurosim will be happy to answer any questions you may have, may also take application forms maybe from uh, new universities keen to, to join uh, Eurosim, which is indeed, I think, providing a wonderful experience to um, students. So this is the end uh, of this panel. So thank you so much to all of you for the presentations and for the questions. And uh, we just have a one minute break in until the next session starts. But if you want to grab a glass of water or a coffee, this is uh, your opportunity. And then we will start the next session shortly. Thank you. <laughs>